The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. The hearing is titled Beyond Scope, How the SEC's Climate Rule Threatens American Markets. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous material to the chair for inclusion in the record. And before proceeding to the opening statements, I'd like to engage uh, with a ranking member in a colloquy. Um, as members know, we've been working to implement e electronic voting in this committee for a number of years. Uh, in fact, multiple Congresses. Uh, we've held three open houses prior to the April recess to educate members and staff. Uh, we'll hold another one after this hearing and again tomorrow. Uh, other committees have electronic voting, and so uh, they may, uh, members of this committee may have experience there. We'll vote next week using electronic voting during our scheduled markup. And I want to take this opportunity to set out my expectations for how this will work for all members. For the first markup only, we will conduct a quorum call to ensure all members are able to use their electronic devices. From there, I'll announce each request for recorded vote, as is the current practice, and open the vote for members to cast their votes electronically. The goal here is, to be, is for the electronics to be a time-saving device. I'll work closely with the ranking member to ensure that all Democratic members have cast their vote, uh, and all members of the committee have the opportunity to cast their vote. As is the current practice, I'll ask if all members have had an opportunity to vote or wish to change their vote before closing the vote. From there, I'll announce that the vote is closed. At that point, as is the current practice, I will ask the clerk to report. We will pause to accommodate technical issues. If a technical issue cannot be resolved for a member, I will direct the, cl the clerk to call on that member to record their vote orally. If more than five members have issues with their vote, uh, with their voting device, we will revert to calling the roll orally. Um, and so, with that, I'd, I'd ask the ranking member if uh, if if uh, the ranking member is, is comfortable with that process. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the uh, uh, practice sessions that you have afforded uh, to all of the members. Uh, and what you have explained uh, with regard to execution of uh, electronic voting seems very reasonable to me. Now, perhaps I need a clarification on one thing. During a roll call vote, sometimes members vote in error, and the calling of the roll provides me and staff with additional time to verify if all members have voted as they intended. If requested, will you accommodate uh, requests from myself uh, for additional time uh, before closing the vote to verify if all members have voted as they intended? Of course. And I'll always work with the ranking member and her members to ensure votes are cast as a member intends. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your consideration on this effort. And uh, I'm looking forward to it, and I yield back. Excellent. Well, I want to thank the ranking member. I want to thank uh, uh, her staff, uh, the Democratic uh, 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 Financial Service Committee staff working with the Republican staff uh, on this matter. Uh, I know we started this initiative when she was chair pre-COVID uh, and uh, with the leadership of the House Administration Committee and Chairman Style. I want to thank the House Administration Committee for making this more available to committees across the campus. Um, I know other committees uh, do this and do this well and is the intention of this committee to be able to move uh, uh, more expeditiously through votes while still accommodating members' ability to vote. Um, and really grateful that we can uh, close this process out and at least get rolling here. <laughs> um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll now recognize myself for four minutes about the subject of this day uh, in this hearing. Um, we're here to discuss the Securities and Exchange Commission's recently finalized climate disclosure rule, which will be disastrous for American markets job creators, workers, and investors. It's costly, complex, and against the public good. The final rule is not a so-called compromise. It is yet another attempt by the Biden administration to force its climate regulatory policy agenda on the public through financial regulation. I want to be clear, climate change is real. Human activity contributes to it. It's a significant challenge that America and the world is grappling with and will continue for decades to come to grapple with. But this hearing is not about climate change. 
It is about the proper role of our securities regulator. So when you hear Democrats accuse Republicans of being anti-science, they're proving our point that this rule is about the left's climate policy agenda, not simply standardizing corporate disclosures. The SEC is not a climate regulator, nor should it be. Congress has never authorized it to act as one. The final rule clearly exceeds the Commission's statutory mandate. This is par for the course with the current Securities and Exchange Commission. Whether it's inadequate public engagement, failing to comply with the Administrative Procedures Act, attacking innovation, or issuing rules that exceed its authority, Chair Gensler's SEC clearly thinks it's above the law. And it's not just Republicans sounding the alarm. In the past 12 months, a federal judge imposed sanctions on the Securities and Exchange Commission for its, quote, gross abuse of power, end quote, in the debt box case. The judge in the Ripple case criticized the commission's lack of, quote, faithful allegiance to the law. And the judge in the Grayscale case found that the SEC acted in a, quote, arbitrary and capricious manner. It's clear Chair Gensler's SEC is tarnishing the reputation of this very important institution. The final climate disclosure rule is yet another glaring example of the agency's overreach. First, the rule will significantly harm our markets and job creators. It will force public companies to decipher an 886-page rule, increasing costs for a public company by 21%, according to the SEC's own estimates. Many, including Commissioner Peirce, uh, have noted this estimate is likely on the low end. Such a massive increase in compliance costs will impede firms from going or staying public. Oddly enough, the largest companies often attacked by the progressive left are the only ones who might be able to afford these enormous new costs. Second, the rule will crush everyday investors. Fewer public companies mean fewer investment options for families to save and build wealth. Everyday investors will also be overwhelmed, not informed by the amount of granular, complex, non-economic information required by the rule. Contra contrary to Democrats' claims, it's non-economic actors and progressive stakeholders who are demanding these climate regulations, not everyday investors. Finally, the climate rule will hurt American workers who are already struggling to make ends meet under Biden and economics. Increased costs will force companies to hire fewer employees, invest in fewer job-creating opportunities, and pass higher costs on to consumers. It's clear the SEC's climate disclosure rule would be catastrophic for our markets and American competitiveness. The Commission's stay of the rule is not enough. Instead, I urge Chair Gensler to abandon this regulatory power grab and return his focus to the statutory role of the SEC, protecting investors, maintaining fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitating capital formation. And if he doesn't, well, this Republican House will be forced to act. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the member from California, the gentlewoman uh, uh, ranking member, Ms. Waters, for four minutes for an opening statement. Good morning. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, last year was the hottest year on record. Mr. Chairman, Climate change is real. It was with the realities of climate change in mind that the SEC finalized its long-awaited climate disclosure rule last month. This rulemaking is common sense. The climate crisis affects the financial health of public and private companies and investors who have a right to know how the companies they own are responding to this crisis. Unfortunately, MAGA Republicans don't see it this way. Not only do they deny that climate change is real, but they also don't want anyone else to acknowledge its reality either. My Republican colleagues want to block America's investors from knowing key information about stocks and outright ban them from making sustainable investments. Neither Congress nor our regulators can ignore the impact of the climate crisis on the financial system. In California, climate change-induced wildfires 
are leading to insurance company withdrawals, premium spikes, cancellations, and other restrictions on coverage for people all across the state. Nevertheless, MAGA Republicans downplay the climate crisis by inviting climate deniers at hearings, as hearing witnesses, and marking up legislation that prohibits regulators from mitigating such risk in our financial system. So despite the extreme MAGA effort to ban sustainable investing or ESG, committee Democrats have been pushing the SEC to use its clear and long-standing tools to finalize and implement a strong climate rule to ensure investors receive the information they need. I'm disappointed that the SEC, under immense pressure from MAGA and their corporate donors, didn't muster the political courage to adopt a bolder rule. Nevertheless, the SEC's rule, once implemented, will establish a clear framework to standardize climate disclosures, and in this sense, it is historic and overdue. Mr. Chairman, sustainable investing doesn't just benefit investors. It's also good for business and serves as a key element of capitalism, where investors get the opportunity to consider the true potential risk, rewards, and impacts of the investments they're making. Unfortunately, the SEC rule is being challenged by several well-funded special interests trying to eliminate it entirely. These groups have succeeded in forcing the SEC to pause its rule while they wait for the court to consider the lawsuit. Stopping government action on climate change is consistent with the aims of Project 2025, Trump's subversive and radical agenda to kill progress, prosperity, and freedoms in our country. The plan includes not just dismantling federal and state climatic-related policies, but also gutting the Environmental Protection Agency, making clean air and drinking water a luxury in our time. Committee Democrats will stand up to these attacks and making sure that people just trying to save for retirement or provide for their family have the information they need to make smart investment and economic decisions and that Project 25 never becomes a reality. With that, I yield back. General Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Heising, a chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, only in Washington can you add 350 pages of text and call it a clarification and a simplification. So in a rush to appease the left, Gary Ginsler finalized a nearly 900-page climate disclosure rule last, my, last month, which celebrated a, quote, narrow approach. Uh, look, let's not be fooled. The rule is still unworkable, no matter how much spin my Democrat colleagues put on it. In the two years since the climate disclosure rule was proposed, we have seen a deluge of new rules and an unprecedented assault on our capital markets. The commission finalized the climate rule despite no clear authorization from Congress to do so. Although Chair Gensler has repeatedly reminded the public he is not a climate regulator, we agree, uh, under his leadership, the SEC has strayed far from its clear statutory mission. Investors should know that the SEC's overreach will significantly hurt our economy while serving as a boon for special interests and far-left activists. Unless he radically alters this approach to regulating our capital markets, his legacy will be that of an overzealous bureaucrat who's been repeatedly slapped down by the courts. Oh, I yield back. Expired. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Capital Markets, Mr. Sherman, for one minute. Today's hearing is an attack on capitalism. The, under capitalism, those with capital are given the information that they want to make the capital allocation decisions as they decide. And government's role is to make sure that that information is reliable and comparable. And a material percentage of American investors find that climate is material to their investment decisions. Under anti-capitalism, central planners at the government decide what factors should go into capital allocation decisions. And apparently, the majority believes that the government has already decided that such decisions must be made solely on the basis of earnings per share and is now working to deprive those with different decisions, with different criteria, 
from uh, getting the information that they need and instead force them to fall in line with the government's capital allocation decisions. Investors want the information, and under real capitalism, we get it for them, and we make sure that it's reliable and comparable. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Today we'll uh, welcome the testimony of our five witnesses. Uh, Mr. Alad uh, Roisman, partner at, with Cravath, uh, Swain, and Moore, and former commissioner and acting uh, chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Mr. Robert uh, Stebbins, um, partner with Wilkie, Farr, and Gallagher, and former general counsel of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Mr. Joshua White, assistant professor of finance at the Owen Graduate School of Management at Vanderbilt University. Uh, Mr. Chris Wright, chief executive officer of Liberty Ener Energy. And Professor Jill uh, Fish, uh, the Saul A. Fox Distinguished Professor of Business Law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Welcome. We thank each of you for being here. Uh, each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony, and without objection, your written testimony will be included in, as part of the record. Uh, we have a lighting system, and just like in society, uh, red and green mean certain things. Uh, yellow specifically means hurry up, uh, because we're about done. So. Uh, with that, Mr. Roisman, uh, you're uh, recognized for uh, five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. And thank you to your staff uh, for helping coordinate this uh, hearing as well. My name is Alad Roisman. I'm a partner at the law firm of Crevasse, Wayne & Moore. But today, I'm presenting my own views and not those of my firm or any client of the firm. My testimony and the views I will express today are informed by nearly 20 years of experience in both the public and private sectors working on securities, regulatory, and compliance matters, affecting public companies and other securities market participants. In my practice at Cravath, amongst other matters, I advise public companies on disclosure, governance, and compliance. Prior to joining Cravath, I had the distinct honor and privilege of serving as a commissioner and acting chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. I was appointed to the SEC after serving as chief counsel for the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. And before that, I served as counsel to then SEC Commissioner Daniel M. Gallagher, as a chief counsel at NYC Euronext, and as a corporate lawyer in private practice in New York. My statement today focuses on certain implementation challenges with respect to the SEC's newly adopted rules requiring companies to disclose certain climate-related information in registration statements and annual reports. I believe that the final rules represent some of the most significant expansions of public company disclosure requirements in decades. Compliance with the new requirements will be a major undertaking for many public companies and will be costly. Some requirements will be particularly challenging given the compliance schedule mandated by the final rules. And while the SEC cites the goal of comparability and consistency as one of the primary reasons for this rulemaking, I fear that this may not be achieved given the different assumptions, estimates, and definitions that will underlie company disclosures. Furthermore, because some companies will make determinations of whether to disclose information based on involving foreign and state laws, comparability and consistency will be especially hard to achieve. I believe companies will need to spend significant time and money in order to analyze, prepare for, and ultimately comply with the many new requirements of the final rules, costs that will ultimately be borne by investors. The final rules introduce a prescriptive climate-related disclosure regime that is likely to result in extensive and granular disclosure on topics that many companies previously determined were not material to investors under SEC existing guidance and disclosure requirements. I hope that my testimony is helpful to members of the committee in highlighting some of the concerns and issues that public companies will be grappling with in complying with the final rules and some of the pra practical difficulties in the application. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now recognize Mr. Stebbins uh, for uh, five minutes. Uh, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, the views expressed in this testimony are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of my current employer, Wilkie Fire and Gallagher, or any client of the firm. 
Uh, the climate rules were adopted by the SEC in March 2024, pursuant to an adopting release of almost 900 pages. This followed a proposal of March 2022 that generated in excess of 24,000 comments. A recent memo published by a leading law firm called the rules perhaps the most controversial rulemaking in SEC history. In my written testimony, I summarized certain recent federal court challenges to the SEC rulemaking and then provide an analysis of legal challenges to the climate rules. A number of the rules <clears throat> recently adopted by the SEC have been challenged in the federal courts, and the SEC has suffered a number of setbacks in these cases. These cases involve the proxy rules, the share repurchase rules, the private fund advisor rules, the dealer rules, the short sale rules, and the securities lending rules. Many of these challenges were heard in the US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. In addition, in 2022, the Fifth Circuit also ruled against the SEC in a case relating to the use of the SEC's administrative courts. This case was appealed to the Supreme Court, was argued in November, and a decision is pending. Uh, as to the current rule and the challenges, litigation challenging the climate rules ensued promptly after the rules were adopted, as expected. Petitions were filed in the Second, Fifth, Sixth, Eighth, and D.C. Circuits. A lottery system subsequently selected the Eighth Circuit to hear the consolidated cases. And on April 4th, the SEC issued an order staying climate rules pending the outcome of litigation of the Eighth Circuit. Um, as to an overview of the legal challenges to the rules, Liberty Energy filed a motion for an administrative stay in the Fifth Circuit, uh, arguing the client rules violate three things, the Major Questions Doctrine, the Administrative Procedures Act, and the First Amendment. And the SEC filed a response to this motion. So I think those two filings give a pretty good roadmap as to the litigation to come. As set forth in my written testimony for the reasons described in the testimony, I believe there's a strong basis for the Eighth Circuit and the Supreme Court to conclude that the climate rules violate the major questions doctrine as set forth in West Virginia v. EPA. As to the APA, for the reasons set forth in my testimony, I believe that a reasonable basis exists for the Eighth Circuit and the Supreme Court to find an APA violation. And as to the First Amendment challenges, First Amendment challenges are extremely difficult to win against the SEC in connection with its disclosure program. So I think that's extremely less likely uh, to see a, uh, a successful challenge as to the First Amendment grounds. However, if the Supreme Court did set aside the climate rules based on First Amendment grounds, this decision would be potentially devastating to the SEC and would put substantial legal stress on many of its other ongoing reporting requirements as the SEC uh, depends on, quote, compelled speech. Um, my comments are in no way meant as a criticism of the staff of the SEC. I was general counsel of the SEC for four years, and it was an honor to work with the SEC staff on a daily basis. I have the utmost respect for them. This is a rulemaking they're instructed to prepare, and people from my former office will be defending the rule in the federal appellate courts. Uh, but this is a rulemaking that will be challenging for them to defend. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now recognize Mr. White. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the House Financial Services Committee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss the SEC's climate-related disclosure rule. I look forward to discussing this important issue with the disclaimer that my views may not reflect those of my employer, Vanderbilt University. The adopted rules will require comprehensive climate-related disclosures, including those on governance, business strategy, targets and goals, greenhouse gas emissions, risk management, and financial statement metrics. Thus, it is crucial to consider the economic implications, which the SEC readily admits will substantially raise the direct costs of being a public company. The spillover effects of this rule could also have wide economic consequences, potentially leading companies to exit public markets or choose to stay private, reducing capital formation and job creation, and limiting investment options for everyday investors. In my written testimony, I draw on my experience as a former SEC financial economist and my scholarly work on conducting cost-benefit analyses around rulemaking endeavors. I outline several critical issues concerning the SEC's economic analysis 
of the climate disclosure rule. I would like to draw your attention to three. First, I'm concerned that the rule mandates costly and granular disclosures that are not economically material, such as scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions. This concern is exacerbated by the SEC's economic analysis, which ignores recommendations and data provided by the public. Multiple commenters asked the SEC to conduct an event study on greenhouse gas emission disclosures. An event study is the classic test of whether information is economically meaningful to investors. Fortunately, a University of Pennsylvania professor, Dan Taylor, conducted such a test study and found that the average greenhouse gas emission disclosure does not elicit a stock price response that is different from zero. Thus, we can expect that scope one and scope two disclosures will provide climate information that does not change stock price valuations for most investors. Rather than acknowledging these findings in the economic analysis, the SEC instead pointed to an academic publication with data that actually predates its 2010 climate-related guidance. Second, the SEC fails to make a convincing economic argument for prescriptive disclosures, as the, ex as the existing principles-based system already mandates that registrants disclose material climate information. Studies show that following the SEC's 2010 guidance, registrants strengthened their climate risk disclosures, especially when they operated in industries where climate factors are more likely to impact their operations. The SEC's cost-benefit analysis discusses how climate risks are on average reflected in stock prices, likely due to this principles-based disclosure that already exists. Thus, I expect that mandating additional information will provide limited benefits, but will come at a substantial cost. This leads to my third point, which is the SEC projects that the climate disclosure rule will raise the cumulative disclosure burden for public companies by 20%. While this is no doubt an economically large amount, I am concerned that the SEC's final cost estimates are too low and do not capture the unintended consequences of the rule. Such a result would not be unexpected given that the SEC found compliance costs for provisions of Sarbanes-Oxley exceeded the estimates in the final rule by more than 350%. I believe the SEC should have reproposed, not adopted the final rule due to the substantial changes that were made which would have allowed market participants to offer more precise compliance cost estimates following these changes. In closing, I'm highly concerned that the climate-related disclosure rule will increase costs with limited economic benefits for most shareholders. It could reduce the number of public companies, arm capital formation, and ultimately impede economic growth. I look forward to your questions. Mr. Wright, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee. I am Chris Wright, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Liberty Energy. I am also the author of a new report on energy and climate change titled Bettering Human Lives 2024 and the founding chairman of the Bettering Human Lives Foundation focused on expanding access to clean cooking fuels in Africa. Liberty employs over 5,000 people and fracks roughly 20% of the onshore wells drilled in the United States and Canada. We are proud to say that about 10% of total primary energy production in the United States comes from wells fracked by Liberty. Liberty has been a leader in next generation technologies that reduce our impacts. Two examples are Liberty's quiet frack fleets and our leadership in re replacing diesel powered frack fleets with natural gas fleets. While investors are keenly interested in our innovations that lower emissions of both air pollutants and greenhouse gases, I am not aware of any specific investor requests for reporting along the lines of the SEC climate rule. The SEC serves as an important regulator for our financial markets. Liberty has dealt with the SEC for many years, both before our IPO and for the six years that we have been a public company. We have had only positive and constructive interactions with the SEC, but now the SEC is proposing to venture well outside of their lane without any congressional mandate to do so. We strongly oppose this destructive mission creep. Climate change is a complicated global issue that I have studied, written, and spoken about for nearly 20 years, but it is certainly not in the SEC's purview. That's why, about a month ago, Liberty instituted a challenge to the SEC's climate rule in federal court and asked for the rule to be stayed pending this challenge. The SEC vigorously opposed the stay but it was granted anyways by the Fifth Circuit. Last week, the SEC decided to stay the climate rule itself. 
We appreciate this gesture, but remain committed to seeing this misguided rule drop permanently. How might climate change impact Liberty's operations? Global average temperature has risen by roughly two degrees Fahrenheit over the last 150 years. Extrapolating the current rate of satellite observed warming would imply roughly two more degrees Fahrenheit of warming by the end of this century. We operate at minus 30 degrees in North Dakota and at over 110 degrees in South Texas, a range of 140 degrees. A few degrees warmer simply will not impact our operations. What about extreme weather? We work in areas where tornadoes visit, hurricanes and floods too. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports no significant trend in these weather extremes. U.S. flood damage as a percent of global GDP has been on a downward trend since 1940, and global weather disaster losses as a percent of GDP have declined about 20% since 1990. Hence, there's no obvious growing threat to our business from extreme weather. Nevertheless, the SEC's climate rule mandates that public companies now must spend considerable resources to track and report impacts from the supposed changes of extreme weather events. Why? In our Bettering Human Lives report, we tallied the growth in global energy production by source since 2010. Natural gas is the fastest growing source of energy in absolute, not relative terms, supplying nearly 40% of growth in global energy consumption. Oil is the second fastest growing energy source. Hence, global demand for our industry's products is at a record high and rising. Liberty also has ownership stakes and partnerships with both a nuclear small modular reactor company and a leading next generation geothermal energy company. We have positive outlooks for both companies and their technologies. Where do we see climate risks for our business? Regulations, like th those proposed by the SEC. These regulations will be costly to comply with and will invite litigation from parties seeking to hamper our industry. The net result will be to make it costlier and riskier to produce oil and gas in the United States, which surely will reduce U.S. production at the margin. The SEC climate rule will do nothing to reduce demand for oil and gas while reducing U.S. production. Two results can be expected. Higher costs for U.S. consumers and businesses and increased oil imports. Outsourcing oil production to foreign countries like Iran, Russia, and Venezuela will certainly increase global greenhouse gas emissions and reduce energy security and economic well-being. Why impose a complex regulatory rule with no apparent climate benefit and easily foreseeable downsides? What am I missing? Thank you. Professor Fish, you're recognized for five minutes. You have to turn on, please turn on your mic. There we go. There we go. Uh, it's an honor to participate in today's hearing. Uh, my name is Jill Fish. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. As an academic, I've been teaching and writing about securities regulation for 35 years. Before that, I worked for a big law firm, and prior to that, at the Department of Justice. The U.S. capital markets are unparalleled throughout the world for their size and quality. They are important not just for businesses to raise capital, but for individuals. Uh, today, more Americans own stock than ever before. Many depend on the strength of the capital markets to secure their savings for a home, the education of their children, and their retirement. The key to this success is Congress's wisdom in creating a disclosure-based system and tasking the SEC with determining the required disclosures. In adopting the federal securities laws, Congress explicitly recognized the importance of market integrity to the broader public interest, stating that orderly and efficient capital markets contribute to the strength of the U.S. economy and protect interests beyond those of investors. Over its 90-year history, the SEC made regular adjustments to address issues ranging from executive compensation, Y2K risks, cybersecurity, environmental risk, human capital, political risk, and the impact of COVID-19. In addition to quantitative disclosures, the rules focus on providing management's perspective on a company and its material risks. As part of this longstanding framework, the rule focuses on material climate-related risks and the impact of those risks on operations. 
My written testimony offers specific examples of how this information helps investors. Investors also use this information to evaluate management quality. It is a red flag if management is not monitoring risks that are likely financially to impact uh, financial condition. Voluntary disclosures are not the answer. They're often inconsistent, incomplete, inaccurate, and unreliable. In response, the rule increases standardization and comparability of key climate-related disclosures, reduces search costs, and increases reliability by bringing these disclosures within the securities reporting process. Criticisms that the SEC's rule exceeds its authority by requiring disclosure of non-material information are not well-founded. First, the rule limits required disclosures to information that's material to investors. Second, the SEC's authority has never been limited to requiring disclosures that are individually financially material, and there are many historical examples to the contrary. Simply put, the SEC acted squarely within its wheelhouse. The rule is the product of careful study, including analysis of thousands of public comments, and the application of the SEC's technical expertise to the complex issue of capital market disclosure. Within that context, the rule is incredibly modest. It's a disclosure rule only. It mandates no change in business operations. It focuses on a small subset of the sustainability considerations that market participants identified as most important. It requires very limited, and in some cases, no disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions, though investor demand for them is overwhelmingly high. For example, the rule does not require any disclosure of scope three emissions, even when those emissions are material. The rule prioritizes disclosures where the potential for greenwashing is high, such as targets and transition plans. A review of the comment file provides ample basis for the SEC to have gone much further. The SEC has also adopted a variety of measures that reduce compliance costs, materiality qualifiers, limiting the required disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions, extended timelines for implementation, and safe harbors for liability. My written testimony has more on the trade-offs the Commission made, and I'm happy to address them in Q&A. Significantly, the SEC did not adopt this rule in a vacuum. The disclosure standards adopted by the EU, California, and the ISSB will require many large U.S. issuers to meet more demanding standards than those in this rule. This suggests the SEC could have been more ambitious in its disclosure mandate, or sought to reduce the impact of multiple and potentially conflicting disclosure requirements. In the absence of any SEC reporting requirement, or if the SEC's rule is curtailed, it's likely that those alternative systems will set a different and higher baseline for climate-related disclosures. Thank you, Chairman McHenry and Rank Ranking Member Waters for inviting me to participate in today's hearing, and I welcome your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you all for your testimony. I very much appreciate it, uh, and the committee appreciates it. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening state, uh, uh, for questioning. Um, Mr. Wright, um, you're in a unique position, I think, to answer the set of questions, but uh, so you, you comply with environmental law where, where your business is, uh, wherever you're doing projects, is that correct? Absolutely. And at, at the corporate level, you comply with environmental laws of the United States? 100%. Okay. You also uh, follow securities law, is that correct? Yes, we do. Okay. So you know the distinction between your obligations in the securities marketplace to your investors, to your owners, to your shareholders, to your board of directors. You also know the obligations under law uh, to the environmental impacts of any, any actions you take uh, to uh, wherever you're doing projects. So what is the distinction here? So when we have a securities regulator acting as an environmental regulator, uh, what, what level of complexity does that add to, to, to projects that bring down the cost of energy, make it more available to the American people, to the world? Uh, how does that impact uh, your investors? Walk us through the distinction between the two, environmental rules versus uh, securities rules. Yeah, of course, they're quite different, and different people involved with them. Obviously, it's our accounting and legal department that do our SEC compliance or whatever. Quite proud of the, the role our team does in that. 
Environmental rules are very local as well. We operate a lot in Colorado, the tightest regulations on, you know, of course, not just greenhouse gas emissions, but on pollutants and noise and dust and all sorts of environmental regulations. So we've got a technical team that deals with Colorado about how to optimize, you know, even helping them to understand what are the generators of pollutants, you know, how, how can we do this together better? Um, but for the SEC to get into the very complex area of greenhouse gas emissions, to me, that the thing right up front is they're going to get it wrong. Um, it is very hard. It's easy to track dollars and cents precisely. They come into an account. They leave an account. Greenhouse gas emissions are quite complex. It's, it's not just what engine is burning what fuel. It's what's the temperature. What's the fuel mix? How good's the combustion? How's the engine tuned? You never can, you can't specifically and directly measure greenhouse gas emissions. It's all about guesstimates. Um, and if we're told to take guesstimates, so with your securities filings, uh, are guesstimates okay with your accounts and lawyers? They are not. Uh, and post Sarbanes-Oxley, there are consequences when you are guesstimating in a corporate environment. I, I sign my name every quarter. That all right. I, I endorse so you're the sign numbers your name we supply. On a set of disclosures, that you have just said as an expert in this field, in this energy production field, in this specific field that is gonna be very impacted by this set of rules, that the best estimate you have in a business that has dollars and cents attached to investments, the best estimates we get in greenhouse gas emissions are guesstimates. They are guesstimates. And you're gonna to have to certify under the same penalties that apply to your corporate disclosures, whether or not you're rigging accounting, uh, the same standards on guesstimates. That's okay. my biggest concern. It will invite litigation, um, an effort that won't go towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions or improving our business or our operations or any of those things. Okay, you It'll be, how do we minimize our litigation risk? So the, the Securities Exchange Commission has justified the climate rule by saying that investors, quote, want and quote, need the type of information required by this rule. Uh, you talk to your investors uh, regularly, at least quarterly, right? Absolutely. You spend a lot of time with activists in this space. Do they, are they asking for this type of disclosure? Do they want this type of disclosure? I've never heard a request for anything remotely like what's in the SEC rules. But yes, do we engage in dialogues with our customers about greenhouse gas emissions, what we're doing, the trends in those technologies that can improve them? Absolutely. And materiality, right? It, you're in a business that is dealing with carbon, and uh, disclosure, disclosures around carbon and carbon emissions are material to your business. You already disclose. Is that we correct? Do. Yes. We do. All right. So about materiality, uh, Mr. Roisman. Um, Let's talk about materiality as a, as a basic underpinnings of securities law. So if you just would give me a little color there as my time is about to run out. So materiality, uh, most people think of the Supreme Court cases, basically Levinson and TSC, uh, uh, industry versus Northway. And it's always been this concept that there's a substantial likelihood that the information is material if a reasonable investor uh, would consider it important in making an investing or voting decision, or such a reasonable investor would find the omission of that disclosure to substantially uh, or significantly alter the total mix of information. It's, it's an, uh, a longhand way of saying, is this information important for investors from the eyes of a company uh, about what will be impactful uh, to that company? And this climate rule is different than this question of materiality that's been longstanding. The level of prescriptive disclosure uh, makes this unlike any rule that I'm aware of. All right. Uh, we'll now recognize the uh, ranking member of the Capital Markets Subcommittee, Mr. Sherman, for five minutes. Thank you. It is long past time that companies report how resilient they are and hopefully move to become more resilient. It is long past time that companies report what effect they have on our climate and hopefully society will insist that they try to reduce that effect. Uh, Mr. White points out that all the burdens of these regulations are falling on publicly traded companies, and I agree with him, and I hope this committee will consider legislation so that multi-billion dollar private companies will also make these same disclosures because they have the same effect on our climate 
and because the stakeholders in a company are not just the shareholders who might be private, but the, the public as well. There have been comments on the cost of these disclosures. I'll point out that many of these companies have to do reporting anyway because of the European Union or because of a number of states, including my own progressive state of California. And so uh, this may not add much to their costs at all. I'm hoping that as we move forward, the states, the SEC, and the European Union will do even more to harmonize uh, their, regu uh, their regulations. Um, Mr. White points out that uh, stock prices don't change uh, often as a result of revealing this information. First, one would expect the stock price to change only when the information that is revealed is different from market expectations. Um, if a company comes in with earnings per share, exactly what the market expects, the price of the stock doesn't change. But he also, we may see no change in the price because some choose to sell because they are green investors and others choose to buy because they are anti-green investors who think that, well, the green investors have sold, I have a chance to pick up a bargain. So even if the price doesn't change, the makeup of the shareholders change and shareholders have a right, green and anti-green have shareholders have a right to the information they need. Um, Mr. Wright says that uh, uh, climate change is not a problem for the operations of his uh, natural gas company. I'll simply point out that a story, uh, that a report on the 215 uh, largest public companies indicates that they will incur over a trillion dollars of losses over the next five years as a result of climate change. Whether his particular company uh, is affected, I'll leave to him. Um, I think the SEC has done a good job on climate. We now have to move toward other necessary disclosures. I've been an advocate here of looking at workforce disclosures and disclosures about one's uh, 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 exposure to China because an invasion of Taiwan is certainly a possibility and the economic effects of that would be enormous and shareholders ought to know. So I want to focus on workforce. Um, over the 100 years ago, the price of the stock could be, was very close to the balance sheet. Today, 90% of the value has nothing to do with what's on the balance sheet. It relates the most valuable asset isn't on the balance sheet. It's the workforce that the company has. Uh, Professor Fish, uh, should we require companies to report information about their workforce? Among this would be turnover rates, um, employee training expenses, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, and how diverse their upper management is. Is that a, the next, is that a good project for the SEC to look at? Uh, Mr. Sherman, absolutely. Um, the, when I said that uh, this was sort of a small step in terms of sustainability disclosure, investors have been asking the SEC for dozens of years, not just for modest climate-related disclosures, but disclosures with respect to the range of new and challenging issues that go to a company's resilience. And human capital management is right up there at the center of those issues. Uh, human capital management raises new challenges for companies, both because an increasing percentage of their assets are their workforce, and because there are evolving issues, worker safety, worker turnover, sexual harassment, all of those things are critical in understanding a company's business plan its strategic vision, and the quality of its management. In addition, the other asset that isn't on the balance sheet is uh, research and development. And uh, I have urged on many occasions, and often with the FASB, that R&D expenses be capitalized. And finally, uh, we now have bipartisan legislation to require companies to describe uh, their China risk uh, because uh, that will give them some incentive to try to de-risk and to the extent we're de-risked, that creates a greater likelihood that China will not invade Taiwan because uh, we will be able to stand up to them if they do, and I yield back. 
We'll now recognize the Vice Chair of the full committee, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, you and uh, Subcommittee Chair on Capital Markets, Dan Wagner and, and Bill Heisig of Michigan, for your good work on guiding the response to the SEC agenda on ESG, particularly on E, during this Congress. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, good to see you. Good to have you back at the committee. Uh, when you were general counsel of the SEC, is there a uh, rulemaking? I think you were involved in some 80 uh, different rulemakings during your time as general counsel. Were you accused of the federal courts of being arbitrary and capricious when you were the general counsel? Um, I don't remember if we were or not. The SEC certainly gets uh, sued on every major rulemaking. It just happens the Genzer administration has had a number of major rulemakings, um, but I, I don't recall, sir, if we were, but I think our, uh, our record was pretty good on rulemaking. And did you ever have a federal court suggest that you had to pay the plaintiff's legal expenses due to a uh, poor ruling by the SEC? Uh, I don't recall that. Well, I think we've seen that in this administration under Chairman Gensler, and we've seen bipartisan response here on this committee that uh, the chairman has moved some 60 rulemakings, and in your testimony, you outline uh, just a tremendous number of challenges with them. Uh, and I thought it would be useful to ask you some questions about the Administrative Procedures Act and how do we get a better uh, process here in the Financial Service Committee of overseeing the SEC on that. Um, the final climate rule dramatically differs from the proposal. They got uh, 97,000 comments or something like that. By removing mandatory scope three emissions and adding new requirements, is this something that in, in your view, if you'd been general counsel, you would have recommended a reproposal? Um, I think I would have uh, recommended they send it back out for comment. Uh, logical outgrowth is the theory they'd be relying on. I just think it was substantially changed with uh, the removal uh, of most of the scope three requirements as well as the 1% financial statement test. I think to the better, but uh, I think in many ways it's a new release and that a lot of the focus, you know, it's a large release. It's it's 900 page adopting release. And a lot of the, and the comments were obviously extensive, but a lot of people were focusing on those two topics and with those two, maybe to the uh, exclusion of other topics. And mm -hmm. when those two topics were out of there, uh, I think focus was going to perhaps go more to the other topics. Uh, I, I would have reproposed it. I don't know that that's going to be fatal to the SEC in their court case, but I would have recommended that, yes. And I misspoke. It's not 97,000 comments. It's only 24,000 comments. So I want to let the record uh, be straightened out there. In your testimony the share re on share repurchase rules, uh, the Fifth Circuit again said the SEC acted arbitrarily and capriciously and said they failed to conduct a proper cost-benefit analysis. Now, the SEC is required to do a cost-benefit analysis for rules they propose. Is that right, Mr. Stebbins? Uh, that's correct. It was a Fifth Circuit decision vacating the share repurchase rules uh, and vacating them on two grounds. Number one, uh, these are APA violations. Number one, failure to conduct a proper economic analysis slash cost benefit analysis. And uh, number two, failed to show a genuine problem existed. Uh, they they uh, went back to the staff and asked them to show the problem and they weren't able to do it, or at least they said they weren't going to be able to do it, and they uh, vacated the rule the court yeah. did. So those would be the challenges they'll face again, the same arguments in this, uh, in this litigation. It seems like the problem to me is that we don't have a, a high-quality standard at the commission for conducting a cost-benefit analysis. Um, I, I mean, when you, in your testimony, we talked about it. The chairman, McHenry, mentioned it. 79% of respondents asserted the SEC underestimates the cost of compliance with all of its proposed rules. And in this particular uh, rule, uh, you know, the range was from 197000 to 739000 for annual compliance costs to Mr. Wright's point of view. Isn't that, what do we need to do as Congress to make sure and hold the SEC to a high standard that there's a methodology that's defensible, whether you're at Penn or at Vanderbilt, anchor down, to have a decent cost-benefit analysis? Well, uh, I think Professor White 
is probably in a better position than I am to talk about the cost benefit or the, the cost aspects. I, I thought the cost numbers were are likely going to end up too low um, based on that law firms are now billion dollar entities and charge the going rate in New York City is over $2,000 an hour. So I'm guessing they're going to end up too low on these estimates given the complexity of the rule, but it remains to be seen. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Professor Fish, you are a great uh, professor at the great University of Pennsylvania. And I am a graduate of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and I want to give you a very gracious welcome to our committee. And please give my regards to the Wharton School. That great professor, George W. Taylor, was a good friend to me. And uh, please tell my friends at the Wharton School, hello. And uh, please keep doing your good work. Um, and now, Professor Fish, the SEC's climate risk disclosure rule encompasses a strong set of standards that meets investors' demands for minority, for mandatory corporate transparency, as well as companies' need for clarity. Is that right? Yes, sir, and thank you for your kind words about the Wharton School. That's exactly right. And what I think distinguishes this rule from so many others is just the overwhelming investor demand for this information mm -hmm. and investors' insistence that despite everything that the SEC has done to encourage climate-related disclosure, investors are not getting the information they need. Let me ask you this also, Professor Fish. Do you believe that many of the registrants who would be impacted can and should be prepared to make these disclosures before the final rule requires them to do so? Uh, that's a great question, and that's one of the reasons that it's so tricky to do a cost-benefit analysis in this system, because you've got so many things going on. S just in the two years between the original rule proposal and the SEC's adoption of the final rule, the technology in this area has improved by leaps and bounds. Many more companies are disclosing this information voluntarily, and as I uh, elaborate in my written remarks, there are other regulators who are going to demand this information regardless of what the SEC does. And so would you agree that uh, this is an aggressive enough timeline now? I think it's a very generous timeline, and I think that uh, you also have to keep in mind the fact that regardless of whether there's a mandate, many companies are disclosing some or all of this information voluntarily, and every year increasing their voluntary disclosure in response to investor demands. At the same time, because there isn't a uniform baseline, that information is located in multiple places, it's hard to compare, it's not standardized. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Is the timeline that the SEC adopted generally aligned with many U.S. companies' compliance dates for the EU's corporate sustainability reporting directives and the California laws? Um, well, both of those standards are still evolving, but I would say at least in some cases, the SEC's timelines are more generous than those other regulators. And I want you to know, uh, Professor Fish, that I'm also appreciative that the SEC chose not to take any actions that could lead intentionally or unintentionally to burdensome reporting requirements for production agriculture. You see, I'm also the chairman of the agriculture. I'm sorry, I'm ranking member now of the agriculture. I know my friends would straighten me out. Uh, but now ranking member. Uh, so my question is, would it be burdensome reporting requirements for production agriculture 
when their goods are part of the supply chain for a publicly related company? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, the SEC, I think, was very careful in the scope of what it mandated. But again, these uh, companies that don't aren't subject to the mandate, they still have to report to the extent that they are dealing with customers, suppliers, third parties who are demanding that information. And many, in many cases, large companies with um, climately responsible policies are asking that information from their counterparties. Well, thank you very much, and please keep up the good work. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, the chairman of the Science Committee, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And while it will be a great day when that happens, I would note to my colleague, the ranking member, we're not quite there yet, David. And we also have a slightly different definition of how agriculture is impacted by these SEC issues. Well, when you know you're once chairman, you're always chairman, and you the same, Chairman. You are obviously a great ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That said, since the Biden administration could not successfully implement its climate agenda through Congress, when they controlled both houses, of course, and the White House, it's turned to the agencies to implement climate policy unilaterally. At the SEC, the climate rule aims to implement climate policy under the guise of security regulation. And Mr. Wright, you discussed in your testimony and with Chairman McHenry how your company's been impacted by this SEC rule. Could you expand on that, on how this rule goes beyond the purpose of securities regulation? Yeah, absolutely. Again, securities regulation, essential. SEC's done a great job. My beef is not with the SEC. But yeah, th this is going into a complex topic of climate change, which we don't get specific numbers like we do for financial accounting. My, my other maybe philosophical problem with it, what's the net impact going to be? It's just going to make, we're going to get sued more. It's going to be harder to do business in this industry. We backed a very small company, Nomad, who had a technology to produce sand instead of at a mine and you got a truck at 60 miles, a mine right near the well so that we could reduce driving truck traffic, not dry the sand. You know, of course our industry is driving to do things better, but now that little private company, these couple scrappy entrepreneurs, since, since we, we are their dominant investor, we have some control over them, they're gonna have to figure out how they're gonna count their greenhouse gas emissions instead of running their small business so that we can report them up the chain. Um, I, I view it as, cumbersome, clunky, and not really a climate policy. What's the, how are we going to drive innovation and improve greenhouse gas emissions by making best guesstimates on subjective numbers, as opposed to talking about technologies and big pictures and, and real progress? Clearly, no industry is insulated from this, and the energy sector is seriously harmed, and manufacturers of all sizes will be impacted. And I think very clearly the climate rule hit farmers and ranchers too. Uh, some supporters of the final rule have praised the complete removal of the disclosure requirements for scope three greenhouse gas emissions. Unfortunately, I think this is a mischaracterization of the rule. While the rule scales back the explicit disclosure requirements for scope three emissions, many public companies must still collect emission data from their supply chains to comply with this rule. Uh, Mr. Roisman, could you discuss how public companies in many instances will still need to collect this greenhouse gas information, this data, so I will say this is a, I think many companies are relieved that they will not have to do explicit line item scope three disclosure. However, there are interpretive questions today about what companies may have to do. And one such example is if a company deci decides that they have a material uh, target, climate related target or goal, something that could be net zero or reduction in scope three emissions, they're required to provide investors with enough information to understand the progress they've made it. So if you're required to talk about progress, you're gonna to have to talk about scope three, how you've done every year. And so I think there is concern that even though there's no line item disclosure, you're still gonna qualitatively at least have to talk about how you're meeting those, those goals and the progress you made. And, and this is an issue that is unclear in the rule. Um, people are scouring footnotes, looking at statements, uh, 
And if the SEC wants to clarify that you won't have to do any scope three emission disclosure, I'm hopeful that they're gonna do that soon. Mr. Stebbins, could you offer your expertise on this? Um, I'm a securities lawyer. I would, I would tell people uh, if they're setting goals or have set goals, they're gonna need to do scope three work uh, in order to make a, uh, ev to, to do the analysis, to give people an update based on what I read in the release. And also I would say that as to, um, it says you only have to put scope one and two, and if material, the only way to judge materiality is to do the work. So you're gonna have to, even if you're not reporting it, you're still gonna have to do the work determining one and two. But I think three is in there, um, the way I read the rule. And there's also something in there about reaching out to your suppliers and determining the effects on your customers and suppliers uh, based on climate risks to your business. So to, to say that the food chain up and down, your, your value chain of customers and suppliers isn't gonna be affected in this, I think is an overstatement. Gentlemen's time. Go back, right. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Fish, uh, the traditional role of the SEC and, and a central tenet of our securities laws aims to protect investors. Uh, and because of the asymmetry of information that exists, where, where companies have all the information and, and uh, an innocent investor may have very little, uh, there's a need for disclosures. And that's sort of a framework that, that encapsulates the relationship between the SEC, these companies, wishing to sell securities and, and investors. Is that, a, is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. Okay. So as part of that investment decision, an investor needs to know the risks, correct? Absolutely. And from what we see in the world around us, climate change is a, is a, is a tangible risk. It's, it's ongoing. It may affect some companies uh, greater than others, but at the bottom line here is, is that an investor is entitled to that information. And that has been the long practice. That is not a departure from the SEC's mission. That is, that is a, a, a founding principle within the SEC. Is that correct? Yes, that's been true since the 1930s. The SEC's disclosure mandate is to ensure that investors get all the information they need. And that includes information about material risks, and how management is identifying and responding to those risks. And a consequence of, of, of the lack of disclosure, um, especially in today's world, uh, I, think, I think it's described well by the folks over at Better Markets, uh, and they wrote, the failure to disclose risks, regardless of the source, prevents investors from properly evaluating companies, causes those companies and markets to be mispriced, and distorts capital formation and allocation, which eventually harms the economy, jobs, and growth. Do you agree with that, that statement? Yes, I do. So the, the rule itself just requires disclosure. It doesn't require any action. Is, is, that, is that a fair statement? Yes, that's a fair statement. And what, what advantages uh, do you see, not only uh, in, the, in the climate context, but generally uh, for the strength of our markets. The SEC was established, uh, you know, in response to the collapse of our markets uh, in, in the 20s. And, and it restabilized uh, the markets themselves and, and, and induced consumer confidence to the point where we are the, we are the, the envy of the world in our, in our markets. We have deep and strong markets where investors feel like they're protected. Uh, is this a departure, this, by, by, by limiting disclosures to investors, uh, would this harm the integrity of our markets? 
Well, the rule, I don't believe, limits disclosures to investors. No, 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 no. It's just the opposite. Right. It's the opposite. I believe what the rule does is respond to a very real and very long-standing investor demand. And I think that's entirely consistent with protecting the integrity of our markets, the reputation of our markets. And I would say that reputation doesn't just attract U.S. companies to list, but it attracts companies and investors from all over the world. Right. Um, one of, one of the things that uh, I, I noticed the other day is the, the cost of a kilowatt hour uh, in Europe is about triple what it is in the United States, even though we have, we have robust uh, regulatory uh, fr frameworks in place. And I'm, I'm just, I'm curious if, if, uh, if you know of uh, instances where you know, the greater disclosure not only helps the investor, but helps the integrity of the industry itself. Well, I think that's exactly right. And one of the advantages of broad-based disclosure is so that the market and investors can do comparisons, right? They're not just getting some selective sample of companies, but they're looking across an industry and able to identify, well, what is reasonable? And what's reasonable in the oil and gas industry might be quite, quite different from what's reasonable in technology. That's great. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield back. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the words of a really common sense writer by the name of Robert Ringer, I think this would be classified as another case of the government uh, being the omnipresent defender of the non-existent problems of the people. You know, right now at the height of height of inflationary concern of my constituents, uh, paying more for everything, uh, I'm sure none of them are looking forward to paying more for their stocks because of all the non-value added uh, costs that this proposed rule is going to add to it, you know, by an agency that, <laughs> that let Robert Ringer literally run free after being warned numerous, numerous times, this guy's upon the, doing nothing for 10 years, uh, now they're going to be the climate police. And I guess the next step uh, is that they will criminalize any stock, any stock purchase that uh, they don't think is proper in their view. Uh, Mr. Roisman, can a typical non-institutional investor uh, really make uh, use of the required climate change disclosures to make better investment decisions? I mean, we're talking the average guy in the street. I'm afraid I haven't been at a, an asset management shop that has shown me, uh, you know, how greenhouse gas emissions works into their portfolio theory. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wright, does this rule increase or decrease the chances that the United States will have a sound, diversified uh, energy strategy, and why? Uh, I think it decreases the chances. I think the net result is likely less production here, more production imported from overseas, to me, would be the, the expected net outcome of the rule. Okay, clearly, clearly in concert with the rest of this administration's agenda to make America last, you know. We've, we've heard from the uh, uh, MAGA uh, denigrators already. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, does this rule meet the Supreme Court's major questions doctrine? Uh, in terms of its foundation on congressional authority? Um, I think it's going to be a difficult lift for the uh, commission in that regard. I think there's a, a strong uh, likelihood that the uh, Eighth Circuit and the Supreme Court will strike the rule down uh, based on the major questions doctrine. The major questions doctrine talks about when you're outside your area of expertise, which is in Justice Kagan's well-written dissent, uh, she talks about being outside your typical area of expertise. I think my experience at the SEC, that's certainly the case here. Um, and doing something of large economic and political uh, significance, which I think this rule, uh, you know, that's going to be a difficult uh, area for the SEC as well. And then you need to look to a specific congressional authorization if those other two criteria are met. Uh, the SEC does not have a specific authorization here. They have just the general investor protection mandate. So those will be the questions that the uh, courts will be looking at, the, the criteria. Yeah, so, so more laws made by unelected, unrecallable, 
and totally unaccountable bureaucrats uh, to add to the, the thousand to better than thousand to one odds that if a consumer is hauled into court for a violation of a federal law is made by some unaccountable, unelect, unrecallable, unaccountable bureaucrat, uh, not by people that they elected to make their laws like they think. Mr. Well, Roseman, do you really believe this rule will have any effect on the world climate as the proponents hope it will? I think that Mr. Wright's a better uh, judge of that, sir. I, I am not a climate scientist. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, does the requirement to disclose things like climate-related goals, climate transition plans, climate scenario analysis, and internal carbon pricing really become a mandate uh, to have uh, such things because companies will be afraid not to have them? I think the way this is going to be judged is um, there's already, as I think most of you know, a requirement uh, to j disclose all material economic or uh, all material risk, which includes environmental risk. That's already out there. So if you're requiring, uh, requiring other information to be disclosed that might be viewed as non-material, then you're looking at a cost-benefit analysis, right? And then you're trying to determine what's the cost of this disclosure and what's the benefit of the disclosure. And that's going to be the area where all these requirements uh, will be judged. If there were two or three, I think it's an easier case when there's 30. Uh, so that's how I'd put that. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the ranking member. I thank the witnesses for appearing. And I especially thank you, Ms. Fish, for being here today. Um, you have brought some degree of balance to the panel. Uh, I especially appreciate the fact that the Democratic staff invited you to come to give some degree of balance to the panel. And without going any, to any specificities, uh, are you familiar with the entities that these four white men work for? Yes, I am. Are there smart women working for these entities? <laughs> I believe there are, yes. Are there women working for these entities who could uh, testify about the issues before us today? Uh, I couldn't answer that question, sir. I see. But you believe they're smart? I do. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go on with the uh, traditional questioning. I have a question for you, but within the question, I have a question. So I'll read the question, and then I'll go to the question within the question. And I thank the staff for assisting. The question is, uh, can you explain how these rules will help to protect retail investors who might otherwise struggle to obtain or interpret climate-related risk information about their investments? That's the question. But now the question within the question is, define, if you would please, what a retail investor is for the public. Ah, thank you. So retail investor are regular people like us, as opposed to institutional investors, mutual funds, pension funds, and so forth. And most retail investors invest through intermediaries. Many of us have stock in our, in mutual funds, in our retirement plans, right? The way this rule helps is the people who run those retirement plans have come to the SEC for years and they've said, we need this information. And we need this information for several reasons. One, it helps us understand the financial value, the economic value, the sustainability of these companies in which we're investing our customers' retirement savings, right? And we have a fiduciary duty to collect and evaluate all material information. We need it, we're not getting it. But there's a little bit more. Retail investors have a variety of investment preferences. Some of them want to invest in carbon zero funds. Some of them want to invest in the Catholic Values Fund. So institutional investors have an obligation as part of this robust capital market to satisfy, satisfy those different investor preferences. But you can't do that. You can't construct a fund that meets those preferences without having access to the underlying information. And is it true that the larger investors 
Um, some of them have persons available to them to do research to help them to acquire the intelligence that you've referenced. Is this a fair statement? It is a fair statement, but one of the, uh, I think, repeated uh, uh, statements in the SEC's comment record is even the largest investors are spending hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of dollars, trying to obtain this information. They're paying third-party providers. They're asking companies to fill out extensive questionnaires because they're not getting this information in securities disclosures. And, and this is something that the retail investor, the people like you and me and other persons who are investing in retirement accounts, they don't have the wealth uh, to acquire this level of intelligence, do they? That's absolutely right. So mandatory disclosure, as you say, creates a level playing field for all investors. And um, as we we're going about doing this, uh, making sure that we level the playing field is the way I see it, so that the retail investors, the, the people who just don't have the millions can uh, make proper investments, as we go about doing this, is there a, a way to do it other than to require some disclosure and try to make it uniform? Well, Congress decided in the 1933 Act and the 1934 Act that no, mandatory disclosure was the best, the most efficient system for getting that information to all investors. Well, I want you to know I stand with these retail investors. I stand with the average person who's trying to make an investment I want the playing field leveled for that average person. Right now, they're at a disadvantage. This rule can help us to give them the same opportunities to invest that others have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Oh, Madam Chair, excuse me. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, the uh, chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Committee, and also heads up our um, our Climate Change uh, uh, Commission, our, our, our board here. Uh, Mr. Heisinger for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, like Chairman McHenry highlighted, the SEC's climate rule has deviated uh, from the materiality standard, which will leave investors to be, quote, second-guessed by the SEC. Materiality qualifiers also ensure that companies must disclose climate-related items that the SEC staff as considered important, not investors. Uh, Mr. Roisman, can you explain how special interest groups can take advantage of disclosures borne out by rules such as this? I, earlier we heard from uh, one of my uh, colleague's statements that uh, well-funded special interests are suing the SEC. Uh, I'm sure, Mr. Stebbins, you never saw a well-funded special interest sue the SEC while you were uh, counsel uh, uh, of that. Uh, but, Mr. Roisman, uh, you know, how, how can these well-funded, special, left-leaning interest groups uh, sue the SEC and take advantage? So, uh, um, for better or worse, anyone can really sue the SEC, uh, as we've seen. Um, what I do think... We'll get uh, to Mr. Wright shortly. <laughs> um, I think one of the concerns people are raising uh, about this rule, and it's echoed in, in the statements of Commissioner Peirce and Commissioner Ueda, is that by creating this sort of special set of rules relating to climate, um, you're, you're making it stand apart. And historically, yeah. what the rule has been is companies need to provide information that's material uh, to investors. And it's up to companies to do that, because yeah. they're frankly in the best place to do it. OK. Um, I, I wish some of my colleagues on the other side would uh, think as highly about a, a female and a minority voice on the SEC uh, opposing this uh, as well. It seems to be that you've been lumped in a group uh, as well. But um, Mr. Wright, are you a well-funded special interest? I'm not. <laughs> okay. Didn't think so. Sounds like you're a business person. Uh, so uh, as you know, many companies have been unwilling to stick their neck out like that. Why have you decided to do so? Well, I, th I think the issue is just simply too important to, you know, we could trade groups, everybody's going to sue on it, but we're very passionate about this topic. Um, and it impacts not just our company, but our entire industry. And ultimately, I think it impacts the United States energy system. And being by far the largest producer of energy in the world, it affects the world energy system. So I'm, I'm very passionate about having thoughtful, 
open dialogue yeah. in evaluating trade-offs on how to make our how to how to make those inevitable trade-offs between the energy system and climate change. But a bureaucratic reporting it's rule that'll lead companies to get sued. I, I don't I don't see the constructiveness in that. Materiality sounds like a pretty good watchword. Okay. Um, Mr. Stebbins, uh, earlier someone was asking you, you're kind of getting cut off, I think it was Mr. Posey, uh, on the time. Do you care to expand sort of uh, the effects on scope three? Supposedly scope three was, quote, pulled out, uh, but uh, the, we're hearing that there's going to be some real ramifications and it may not actually have the same uh, effect. Um, I think a lot, the, the uh, statistics show that a lot of companies do set goals in this area, and to the extent you've set goals, I think uh, scope three is gonna be implicated based on the, uh, the adopting release. And I think also it talks about transition plans, which are defined very broadly to mean plans that a company is using to uh, reduce its environmental risks. And in connection with those plans, if you have such, and most companies will. Scope three again uh, comes into uh, play. So I think it's an overstatement to say it's totally out of the release. Uh, is it lessened? Yes, okay. uh, it's lessened. Um, has the SEC stated its own rules previously? Um, it's happened before. It happened okay. in the DC circuit when I was there. I, I gotta move quickly here. So, uh, and then when there are major issues, court cases, legal challenges, et cetera, with a rule, uh, would the and, the, and the SEC would voluntarily um, uh, stay its own rule, would it add a implementation time cushion on the, on the tail end of that? And Mr. Roisman, feel free to weigh in on that as well. You know, basically, would you grant an additional year before you were doing any kind of implementation? I, I think practitioners will expect the SEC, depending on how long the litigation goes, to adjust the time frames. I think that's an expectation. So that, that's a reasonable, Mr. Roisman? I, I think it's more than reasonable. I would, I would certainly hope. Should be that. expected? I, I hope, yes. Would it be I, helpful I if the SEC actually weighed in right now and said we're gonna give very, a, very a one year? So. Very much so. Okay, um, I, that's something I intend to pursue with them. Um, I, uh, Mr. Stebbins, I got a few seconds, but you had uh, hit on the APA as well. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, Mr. White, I can't get to my question for you. I'm gonna be uh, doing a, a follow-up on that, uh, but it seems to me that the an economic analysis adequately con to consider the impacts of the rule wasn't done, so I, I, I will we'll follow up with you on that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Waters, who is also the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Professor Fish. Although I welcome the SEC's latest step in creating a standardized climate disclosure framework, I was nonetheless disappointed that the SEC's final rule fell short of the original proposal. In particular, the rule exempts big banks and insurance companies from disclosing their greenhouse gas emissions, even though what is known, well, it is known as scoop three emissions and gives license to companies to avoid disclosing any of their greenhouse gas emissions if they decide it is not material. The final rule also lessened requirements that companies disclose the potential impacts of transition risk. Do you agree these are areas where the SEC can improve the efficacy of its rule in the future? Uh, yes, I do. And in particular, I wanted to focus on transition risks, targets, and announced goals because the issue has come up in several questions. Well, aren't companies inadvertently going to have to disclose scope three emissions as part of that? And I just want to flag that one of the areas that's just most ripe for greenwashing is the announcement of targets and transition plans without any underlying information. Right? That's not just greenwashing, that's outright fraud. And uh, to the extent that a company makes those statements and therefore puts itself on the hook under the existing rules to say, well, yeah, you know, we're actually monitoring the things, our goals that we've announced. This is the progress that we're making. These are the steps that we're taking. I think that's exactly what uh, information investors need to distinguish true and meaningful disclosures from fraud. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned in your testimony, the final rule also limits the attestation requirements for scopes one and two emissions, and in some cases, 
shields attestation providers from liability. Can you share your thoughts on why this information is important to investors? So uh, auditing, attestation, all of that increases the reliability of information. And auditing has been part of financial statement disclosure for a long time. Uh, issuers are voluntarily, in many cases, providing that same measure of reliability to their greenhouse gas emissions uh, disclosures and to their other climate-related disclosures. And so what the SEC is uh, saying is, look, this is something that adds a tremendous amount to the reliability of this information. This is something that we should facilitate. At the same time, uh, auditing services are viewed as costly, particularly for smaller firms, and so what the SEC has implemented is a graduated level of disclosure uh, with different timelines and different levels of assurance depending on the size of the company. So it's very responsive, I think, to both investor and issuer needs. Well, I want to thank you very much, and I will yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, for five minutes. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, interesting discussion today. Uh, Mr. White, Wright, I'm going to probably aim some questions directly at you. I think it's better to tell you ahead of time rather than repeating the question. When this rule was 886 pages that was issued, the SEC estimated that the rule would increase typical costs of a public company by 21%. I looked at today the website for the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Their website at the very top in, has across it supporting small business. Below that, we inform and protect investors. We facilitate capital formation. We provide data. Well, they are providing data. I, I really wonder how this obvious three to two vote that took place seems like it's anti-investor and and not helpful. Talk with me about your viewpoint about their mission statement, which I took as a mission statement, and about this as it relates to typical cost of being public company increased by 21%. Yeah, I, I, I think that matters a lot. You know, in this country, and I, and I think you've seen the trend, you know, there's less than half as many public companies today as there was a few decades ago. Um, this is unfortunate because it's these public companies that investors, the smallest investors, every investor in this country can access. You know, private companies, there's other vehicles, wealthy people can invest in those deals, but public companies is what's on offer and what's available for, for, uh, for the investors across this country. So making it harder, more expensive, and riskier to being a public company, yeah, reduces investor choices and options. It, it means larger amounts of resources are spent on, in this case, gathering guesstimates that are then assembled. My bigger worry is, and then litigation over the guesstimates. Um, I don't see that as productive. Um, I think the SEC plays a critical role. We need oversight. We need a level playing field. We need to get out fraud. We need to build confidence in our marketplaces. So I think the SEC plays a critical role but when it strays just way outside of its lane, um, I struggle to find anything positive that could come from that. Mr. Wright, I agree with you. I spent 16 years in a public company, uh, moved eight times with them. It was a small company called AT&T. And uh, our job as the management uh, was to encourage not only uh, the formation of capital, but was to encourage the supporting of small business also. We took that as the way that we would grow our value, not just to the shareholder, but to the marketplace. Why would someone put allow this to be up there that obviously is questionable? Why would they, how would they justify this? I'll ask anyone on the panel. Supporting small business, we voted for what would be a typical company a 21% increase in costs. 
Any, anybody on the panel uh, offer some insight into that? Uh, Ms. Madam Chairman, I've seen them. Does well, gentlewoman I, want I, to defend I that? I would just note um, for the congressman that the rules broadly exempt smaller reporting companies and emerging growth companies from virtually all of the reporting requirements, uh, which is consistent with the SEC's longstanding practice. Okay, so of the gentlewoman has been around long enough where she knows that if the big people, the big companies, if they suffer a 21% increase in cost, that means that it binds itself down to smaller companies. That was the one thing that you learned, Chamber of Commerce 101. You get a big company, there are lots of small businesses that feed off that. So what I heard you say is, we're only diminishing the value of the big companies, no process. We can definitely say we're for small business. I disagree. Madam Chairman, I'll yield back my time. Uh, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for giving us some, giving us uh, your time. Um, uh, Mr. Wright, um, uh, this is no catch you, uh, uh, any kind of question that leads to some kind of a nasty comment from me. It's not. It's not. Uh, but I, I would like for you to uh, tell me whether or not you believe that the SEC should uh, still be uh, in existence. Uh, and, and go ahead. All right, I think I read in my opening statement that the SEC plays a critical role, strong believer in it. I've had an only constructive and positive working relationship with it for years. Okay, yeah, I, I, as, as you know, uh, I mean, the SEC came into existence um, in the aftermath of the 1929 collapse. And uh, so it's been in, in existence over uh, 70 years. Uh, and uh, from time to time, uh, the risks uh, have changed, but the SEC's role has remained the same. Do you agree with that? I think the implementation of that role has evolved as finance has evolved and as accounting has evolved and all that. But to protect against fraud and make sure that no, people can trust the numbers from public companies, mm -hmm. I, I think that mission has remained the same. Yeah, so sometimes it seems as if the, the opponents are actually beating up on the EPA as opposed to the SEC. Well, the EPA is an environmental regulator. So yes, I, yes. I, yeah, that, that, that's the question. We have an environmental regulator that, that also is very rigorous in doing its job. Why, why do we want a financial regulator to become an environmental regulator? Uh, as I said earlier, SEC's role stays, has, has remained the same. Um, and uh, th does this rule require companies to reduce emissions? Uh, or, or make any kind of changes to uh, address uh, the risk identified? Um, it certainly makes us change what people in our company do, because now we're going to have to spend a lot of time, again, gathering data that we can't gather precisely. I can't emphasize mm -hmm. that point enough. Um, and, and the biggest issue for us, I believe, is this transition risk in quotes, which is really regulatory risk from the government. Mm -hmm. So do I know what the government, does anyone in my company, does anyone know what the government's gonna do in the future? I don't know how to speak thoughtfully or act thoughtfully on that risk. Mm -hmm. I, I respect uh, the chairman's comments at the beginning. He said, you know, we believe in science and, so, and, and I uh, seriously and honestly respect that because I, I, I think we're probably, probably beyond that. Uh, and and uh, but uh, uh, your comments uh, uh, that the globe is slowly warming and sea levels are gradually rising and have been and it's been about 100 been doing that over 150 years uh, and the the second half of this same period you say since the end of World War II human beings uh, human burning of fossil fuels has increased atmospheric CO2 concentration by 50 percent. Uh, I go on just from your uh, your uh, 
YouTube video, let's be honest. And and if you look, if I listen to that, it, it, it I mean, uh, it's almost like I, you don't believe that that uh, climate change is real because you, I mean, you said you did, and that, but then when I read this, it's you, you're essentially saying no, it, it doesn't. That the scientists are wrong. Not at all. You know, I think the video and the report that I'm reporting the public data on temperature, on sea level rise, on extreme weather. I'm trying to put the public data that we understand about climate change in a more digestible format mm -hmm. so people can understand. We don't know the future, but people can understand at least the history of what's gone on with climate change because you've got to weigh that trade-offs there yeah, with but the importance I, of energy. Mm -hmm, yeah. You, uh, explain this. And I, I'm, my time is running out. You say... Uh, uh, any negative impacts from climate change were clearly overwhelmed by the, bi the benefits of increasing energy consumption. Uh, I'm, can you cl uh, add anything to that, clarify it even more? Yeah, yeah, you bet. So w w the, the arrival of hydrocarbons as meaningful energy sources, maybe a little more than 100 years, 150 years, global life expectancies well more than doubled. The people living in extreme poverty has gone from 90% of humanity to less than 9% today. It's not zero yet. But the 20th century is the greatest century of progress in human history. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Mr. Thank you. Wright. Thank you, Congressman. Gentlemen's time's expired. <clears throat> the chair now recognizes herself for uh, for five minutes of questioning. Mr. Uh, Roisman, the climate rule initially included Scope Three greenhouse gas emissions data, which would have forced Missouri's farmers to track all emissions being produced by their crop and livestock, an extremely time-consuming, costly, and sometimes impossible task. Although it was removed from the final rule, I still have serious concerns regarding the future of Scope 3 disclosures. Can you explain what the SEC could have done if it wanted to fully prevent companies from making Scope 3 emissions disclosures. Uh, for example, could the SEC have considered preempting compliance with other jurisdictions such as California that requires scope three disclosures? Yes, that would have been one way to do it. Additionally, I think they could have made an explicit statement in the rules uh, saying we are not requiring any scope three uh, disclosure requirements. And, and I think one of the, the concerns people have, as you heard from Mr. Stebbins and, and myself, yes is that there will be, uh, certainly a lot of us will be counseling companies that they'll have to seriously consider whether they have to provide scope three emissions. And again, that's up and down the value chain. So many people who wouldn't have thought that they'd had to track any of this information are gonna get in calls from public companies saying, uh, you know, we need to find this out in order for us to comply. Can you explain why the uncertainty surrounding the future of, of scope three emissions disclosures is, is, is troubling outside of your Remarks. So I, I, I do think the SEC goes at great length uh, in the release to talk about the difficulty of actually tracking, assessing, cataloging all this information. Um, I think Mr. Wright did a very good job just talking about the difficulty mm -hmm. of scope one and two. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think the problem is when things are put into an SEC filing, they come with a lot of liability and responsibility. Uh, including oftentimes having to sign your name on, on certain uh, disclosure requirements and being subject to plaintiff lawsuits. So when you have sort of a measurement that is still not that well known or able to be quantified with precision, uh, there's a lot of concern for companies on signing on the data line. Thank you. Turning to Mr. Wright, uh, Mr. Wright, the SEC's decision to remove mandatory scope three emissions disclosures gave many the impression that private companies are no longer affected by the rule. We know that is not true. Mr. Wright, can you tell us how about how private companies like Nomad, your, your co-petitioner in this lawsuit, are affected by the climate rule? Yeah, so look, I've been a lifelong technology innovator, and that's what Liberty Energy does. So we invest in small companies that have exciting technologies that we think we can, can make the energy system better. Part of it is reducing emissions or lower pollutions or lowering costs, all these things we're passionate about. But Nomad is one example I could give others of private companies we've invested in 
that now we have some control rights, so they fall into our greater accounting. Now they have to tally their emissions and we have to sign and attest that those are the best guesstimates or whatever term we're gonna use for that, I don't know. But yeah, absolutely, B big companies partner with small companies all the time. Professor White, Commissioner Peirce stated in her dissent that the, and I quote, commission performs impressive math probatics to slash the anticipated cost of the rule by 90%. Can you explain what costs the SEC left out of its analysis to art, uh, artificially lower the anticipated costs? Yeah, th <clears throat> thank you. So the um, statistic that Commissioner Peirce was referring to was the cumulative external burdens under the Paperwork Reduction Act, and it was specifically on forms S-1 for registrations and the annual reports on 10-Ks. And so the cost estimate was reduced from 6.4 billion to only 600 million. 6.4 billion to what? To 600 million. So that's the math acrobatics uh, <laughs> that uh, Commissioner Purse is, is talking about. Unbelievable. Carry on, please. Correct. And so there was no detail provided around the Paperwork Reduction Act as to where that came from. Now, surely some of this would apply to the removal of scope three emissions. Um, but it's hard to imagine how that cost goes down by more than 90% and should certainly be explained. Uh, I tried to reproduce this in my testimony and was also confused. Right. I appreciate that. My, uh, I have some additional uh, uh, questions that I'll submit for the record. I appreciate all your testimony. My, my time has expired. And I, uh, I now recognize the, the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Beatty, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to ranking uh, chair and to all our witnesses here. Um, thank you for all your comments, your expertise that you have provided uh, today. And certainly, uh, we have heard a lot today. And frankly, over the last two couple of years since this rule was first proposed, uh, it seems like we have heard all about how uh, disastrous and burdensome uh, climate exposure would be. So let me just interject this. Uh, climate should not be a political issue. Uh, it is a reality. We must face it head on rather than burying our heads in the sand pretending that it does not exist or complaining that it would be too burdensome to address it. Investors have been asking for more disclosure. 50% of the voters oppose Congress limiting their access to corporate business records. And as you mentioned, Professor Fish, climate is just one small piece of what investors have been asking for. We should not be in the business of banning what American consumers and investors want just because it doesn't serve our political agenda. Uh, consumers, everyday Americans, are dealing with the effects of climate change daily. They're seeing insurance companies uh, withdrawals, spikes in premiums, and other limitations on coverage as a direct result of climate change. Instead of coming to their aid, we're still bickering about whether or not a problem exists. America knows a problem exists. Meanwhile, other countries around the world are filling the vacuum, taking the lead while we sit back, and in my opinion, even maybe wasting our time. The SEC made significant changes, and I think that's worth noting, uh, Mr. Chair. The SEC made significant change to the final rule in response to feedback from businesses and other shareholders who submitted comments. They have bent over backwards, in my opinion, to address everyone's concern while still establishing a comprehensive disclosure framework that meet investors' demands. Now, now I know you have read all the reviews and certainly um, to one of our witnesses as a former acting chair, uh, I am sure you've gone through all of those thousands or thousands of comments you get, but to uh, my Republican colleagues, it appears that it is still not enough. Stonewalling and refusing to compromise to find workable solutions, I don't believe is any way to go. But now, in my uh, few minutes left, let me go to you, Professor Fish. Uh, other countries are way ahead of the United States when it comes to sustainable 
finance, and climate risk. For example, I've been advised that the European Union has a comprehensive client, climate disclosure regime that's already in effect. What would be the benefits of the SEC harmonizing its climate risk disclosure rules with other countries' disclosure standards? Well, I think there would be tremendous benefits. Number one, a uh, company wouldn't have to uh, be subject to the uncertainty of which regulatory regime they're subject to. Uh, number two, the company could have standardized one set of disclosures, one set of auditors to the extent auditing is, is required, one set of advisors to help them frame the disclosures to comply. Uh, that would greatly reduce the costs, and that would simplify not the, just the costs for issuers, but it would also simplify the costs for investors. We have a global marketplace, not just capital markets, but businesses, right? So harmonization would be, would be a tremendous step. Um, my view is that you know, that's something the SEC should be considering going forward, the extent to which substituted compliance might be a possibility, the extent to which negotiation as opposed to separate rulemaking might provide some sort of global standard. Okay, and, and quickly, I understand that the SEC made significant changes to the final rule, and by the way, there was a female who also supported that to my colleague who wanted to interject about another female, um, that uh, the SEC made significant changes to the final rule in response to the comments on the original. How did SEC make the final requirements less burdensome? And I've got about 20 seconds. <laughs> so um, as a lot of this discussion has focused on, the SEC uh, reduced the requirement for uh, carbon emission disclosures, eliminated the requirement that scope three emissions be disclosed, even in situations in which they're material. The SEC extended the implementation period. The SEC reduced the uh, number of disclosures that have to be made as part of the financial statements. The SEC uh, reduced the uh, uh, oversight responsibilities of auditors. Uh, that's just a sample. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. As the witnesses well know, the Securities and Exchange Commission has a three-part statutory mission. Protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. Uh, Mr. Wright, um, on the issue of protecting investors, uh, Will the additional reporting costs and litigation risk that you have testified about that would result from this rule, would that enhance or diminish the financial performance of your company and other similarly situated energy firms? Diminish. Uh, and would that then uh, uh, protect or harm your shareholders? Harm. Strike one. On the second uh, uh, part of the mission, to maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, Mr. Wright, um, what impact would the rule have on U.S. energy markets? I think on the margin, you'd see less oil and gas production in the United States, but no change in demand, so necessarily more imports, and almost certainly from countries with higher greenhouse gas emissions from their productions. So it would have uh, a, a, an impact on the competitiveness of U.S. energy markets relative to foreign uh, energy producers? Correct. So maintaining efficient markets strike two. And third, to facilitate capital uh, formation, will the rule, Mr. Wright, uh, help uh, uh, your company access capital? Would it facilitate capital formation in the energy sector? No. Strike three. Uh, doesn't look like uh, the SEC is fulfilling its statutory mission here. Uh, Mr. Roisman, uh, Professor Fish testified that the rule will increase the standardization and comparability of key climate-related disclosures uh, and in fact, uh, Chair Gensler uh, makes the argument that we need this rule for comparability and consistency. You testified, however, that you doubt that the SEC has achieved this goal in the final rule. Why are you right, and why is Professor Fish wrong? Uh, um, I don't want to uh, be counter to Professor Fish. Uh, my perspective is that if you're going to have uh, standard line item disclosure, everyone's going to do it. The problem lies, a lot of these things are based on different assumptions. Each company is going to have to make tailored made uh, assumptions to itself and to its business. And because of that, it's really not going to be apples to apples. Well, let, let's, let's, uh, let's settle this debate a little bit more with all respect to Professor Fish. Um, public companies, Mr. Roisman, will be required to disclose in the final rule 
information related to the financial statement effects of, quote, severe weather events and other natural conditions. Mr. Roisman, in terms of severe weather events and other natural conditions, that appears in the final rule 205 times and 158 times respecti respectively. Are either of these terms defined anywhere in the rule? Natural conditions is certainly not. Severe weather events, you get a little bit of a indication that it might be tornadoes, uh, uh, earthquakes. I, I think what I would like to focus, though, on is your point about the accounting treatment, which is uh, a severe weather event for a company is very different about based on where its business is. Whether it's in Kentucky or in Poland or in Belize, companies are going to need to do different policies and procedures to track all of this information in different countries and different areas. And all this information needs to be tracked because there's a very, very low de minimis amount that if you hit it, you got to disclose. So this is going to be a very costly and frankly onerous burden. Doesn't sound like uh, this will enhance comparability whatsoever. Uh, Professor Fish also said that the rule only applies to large companies or large accelerated filers. Uh, Mr. Roisman, do you want to address this claim uh, and the rules application to smaller public companies? So what I think maybe uh, Professor Fisher was alluding to is the scope one and two disclosure requirements. But small companies will be re uh, responsible for the, the, the regulation SK disclosures as well as the SX, which is the accounting uh, information that's going to be in the audited financial statements. So that's for all companies. Yeah, all companies, exactly. All public companies are impacted by this rule. Professor White, final question to you. Um, this issue of materiality, I think, is, is something that we, we talk about a lot in Professor Fish uh, says that the SEC's rule, uh, no, no problems here because it would, in, it, it would, it is, uh, it, it limits disclosures to information that has materially impacted uh, an issuer. Um, Professor White, do all investors benefit when the SEC mandates disclosures that only a specific group of investors who concentrate on a single risk factor deem to be material? No, and there's a lot of special interest groups that are interested in information that are not necessarily representative of all investors, and so that what might be material to one investor might not be material to the reasonable or the average investor. Uh, thank you. I think that's the key. Uh, materiality needs to be about materiality of all investors or the reasonable investor, not just climate alarmists, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and the ranking member. And again, I want to thank all the witnesses here today. I appreciate your testimonies. I know that it, it's tough to work and come here and, and testify, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I do always ask, how many of the witnesses, and I do this every time, how many of you believe in climate change, that climate change is real? If you could please raise your hand. Believe well, just raise, if you don't believe, don't, you don't need to raise your hand. How many people believe that? I always, it's the same question. I want to be fair. How many people believe that climate change is real? If you could just please raise your hands. It's a bad question. Okay, so the question's bad. Okay, I'm going to go on to my next question because you seem to think that's a bad question. Okay. I heard this today and I hear it all the time. The unaccountable bureaucrats versus elected officials. That somehow the elected officials have this special knowledge. Well, I've been an elected official for a long time. And I know a lot of elected officials. I trust the bureaucrats a lot more than I trust the elected officials because the bureaucrats oftentimes have special knowledge, especially in the field that they're making decisions. I mean, it's interesting, we have an elected official here that looks up into the heavens and sees the total eclipse and thinks it's the eschaton that somehow God's talking to us, and it's the end of times that the rapture's about here. Look at the signs. Well, eclipse happen all the time. Numerically, we, we figure these things out, and so do earthquakes. It's, it's not the foretold eschaton or the rapture. It's, just science in the earth. And that's why I don't buy this whole notion that somehow these bureaucrats don't know what the hell they're talking about. Oftentimes, it's really the politicians that don't. But anyway, that's from experience, unfortunately, my own, too. I'll throw myself into that group. But all that being said, I do want to ask this. Professor, you were given strike one, strike two, and strike three. You didn't even get up to bat. I think that's a little unfair. So I want to give you the chance to, to answer those questions before you strike out. So again, in your view, how is the rule consistent with the SEC's three-part mission to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation? You get up to, get up to bat this time. Go ahead before you strike out. 
Thank you. So um, as my written testimony details, um, this is information that investors have been demanding. This is a small tip of the information that investors have been demanding uh, with respect to uh, business risks, sustainability challenges for companies. And it responds to the longstanding information asymmetry. Companies have this information, investors don't. And that information asymmetry, reducing that information asymmetry, is what produces more efficient markets so that investors can choose the companies in which they want to invest, so they can evaluate whether a business plan is resilient for the future, and so they can evaluate the quality of management. And something we haven't really focused on today is investors do that not just by buying and selling securities. They also do that through exercising their governance rights. And part of the SEC's mandate is to provide meaningful disclosure so that investors can vote, so that they can vote to elect directors who are monitoring material risks, so that they can vote for or against shareholder proposals based on how well they think the company is doing. And how does that facilitate capital formation? Well, obviously, if you've got strong quality markets, that's going to make it easier for companies to raise capital, and that's going to tailor the costs of capital to a company's business plan. And we see that in the fact that so many companies come to the US capital markets to raise capital. So, Professor, I don't give you a home run, but it's a solid triple. Stand up triple. I think you did a good job there. Now, I do want to say this. You, you talked about the corporations. A lot of these corporations do, in fact, collect this information, as you said, because they think it's real. They might not think it's a good question, but the reality is that they do compile this information because it's important. And climate change is happening no matter what people think. I mean, in San Diego, I'm from San Diego, and you don't think of floods in San Diego. We just had a gigantic flood in San Diego, a thousand year event. And it flooded a good portion of San Diego, and we had all these problems, something we normally don't get. Now you can't buy insurance in large parts of California because of climate change. This stuff is real. Investors know it, companies know it. The information's there, they should disclose it. And that's what this rule attempts to do. I also wish they would have gone a little further with scope three, but I understand you know, at the moment that maybe that's not the right time to do it, but it, it has to go there at some point. And again, I appreciate all of you being here. And again, uh, I thank the chair, thank you. I yield back. Gentleman, yield, gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the SEC's misguided climate crusade has clearly overstepped their statutory authority by requiring excessive, costly, and detailed climate-related regulations. Instead of meeting the needs of all investors, the SEC has shifted towards pandering towards the progressive shareholders and green uh, activists. This is a dangerous path to go down. It's uh, will have negative consequences for all investors. And the 886-page the climate rule was caused compliance costs to skyrocket for public companies who must comb through the burdensome rule to ensure they are meeting all the requirements. The SEC must return to their core mission and protect the interests of all investors in public companies, not just those who are fixated on politicizing boardrooms and our capital markets. So Professor White, uh, could you elaborate on how this climate rule will increase costs and burdensome compliance requirements for public companies, and I got a follow-up for you. And certainly, the direct cost of the disclosure, as the SEC has estimated, is going to increase costs by upwards of 20%, which is one of the biggest increases, mm -hmm. at least that I'm familiar with in recent times. It's also going to have indirect costs or spillover costs in a sense that it's going to, as Mr. Wright said, raise legal liability, um, and it could have a dampening effect on capital formation. So those together are an enormous cost. Well, another question to you then. This climate rule will increase costs for public companies. We've said that, but many of these costs will also prove to be unbearable for small insurers or issuers. And another concern of mine is how this rule will affect small companies' ability to complete on a global stage. So specifically, the increased reporting requirements and compliance costs will serve as a barrier to entry into global markets uh, for smaller companies. So the SEC's purpose is to allow American businesses to compete, not to try and tie them down with excessive compliance costs and burn some regulations, which seems to be what we're going through with this administration. So one more time, Professor White, what impacts will these costs have on American competitiveness, especially regarding the ability of smaller companies uh, to compete globally? <clears throat> so regulations always have a disproportionate or outsized effect on small companies. And so these regulations I would expect to be more impactful to small companies. We might see fewer IPOs. We might see companies staying private longer. Um, and we may see companies moving to other jurisdictions, which impacts us in terms of losing people, losing tax revenues. 
Um, and your notion of you know, creating an impediment, I like to view these types of regulations as like a brick. While one rule might be a small block, eventually you've built a barrier to going public. And so once that barrier is formed, we lose competitiveness on a global stage. Uh, thank you. Now, this climate rule will open various challenges for companies who are already public for, for companies who are looking to go public. Uh, this rule is a, a significant barrier to entry and will surely dissuade companies from undertaking the necessary steps to go public in fear of the compliance burdens and costs that they will be subject to. So companies will face other challenges like increased risk of litigation and the complexities these uh, the challenges will come with. Because of this rule and the consequences it will bring, companies will have to shift their resources towards compliance and have to sacrifice key services enjoyed by their shareholders or they will refuse to go public in order to protect themselves from needless attacks down at, at them by the SEC. Mr. Stebbins, uh, can you expand on how this misguided and harmful rule will deter companies from going public? Pretty simple. Uh, I think rules aren't passed in a vacuum and I think if you, you have to look at what's happened in the last few years in general and there's uh, it's, it's, there's, this isn't the only rule that's been passed, right? So it's, uh, it's very hard to be a public company right now, and I think all these rules incrementally make it harder, including this one. Well, lots of times you hire these compliance officers who takes away from the core mission. Bottom line, right? Say that again, sir, I'm sorry? Said compliance officers. Compliance officer versus salesman. That tells you the difference <laughs> right there, right? Well, there's certainly a lot of costs built in, and there'll be, uh, there's a lot of costs built into this release, right? Yeah. Uh, attorneys, accountants, consultants, et cetera. Okay. Thank you for that, and I yield my time back. Gentleman yields. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Professor Fish, I'd like to start with you. There's, my, my colleagues have talked a lot about the disclosure requirements for emissions, but, and, and just confirm, a, a lot of this rule is about disclosing your exposure to climate change, not just your contribution to climate change, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And right now, if I understand, there's a, I, th I think I've seen numbers that the average public company spends $500,000 per year complying with voluntary disclosure requirements, right? Well, that's one of the reasons to... that estimating the cost of compliance is so difficult, because of course the SEC doesn't have access to the costs that each company spends on voluntary disclosure. Yeah, so if I'm an investor, or maybe if you're an investor, would you like to know the risks your portfolio is exposed to and which companies in your portfolio are contributing to that risk? Isn't that kind of the basis of being an informed investor? Well, absolutely. I'd want to know the risks, and I'd like to know what the management is doing okay. to respond. I realize I'm preaching to the choir here, but our chairman started this by saying that the Democrats were going to say you're science deniers because we don't want to talk about materiality. This is so deeply right within the SEC's wheelhouse to understand risk, right? But by the way, the SEC does not have an obligation to ignore science, That's right? Cool. Yes. I mean, last time I checked, Elizabeth Holmes committed financial fraud by misrepresenting medical science. FTX committed financial fraud by misrepresenting math, which is a science. There have long been people who have come to Congress and said, I need to misrepresent science. Here's one. James Black, 1977, said doubling CO2 causes, doubling CO2 gases in the atmosphere would increase global temperatures by two or three degrees. Man has a time window of five to 10 years before the need for hard decisions regarding changes in energy strategies might become critical. James Black was a senior scientist at ExxonMobil. He said that privately in 1977. He didn't say that publicly because that would have hurt their share price. Don't ignore science, folks. With that, I turn to you, Mr. Wright. January 2023, you said in a YouTube video, we've seen no increase in the frequency or intensity of hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, or floods, despite endless fear-mongering the media politicians and activists. Same video, you said, there is no climate crisis. We're not in the midst of an energy transition either. Humans and complex life are simply impossible without carbon dioxide. The idea of carbon pollution is outrageous. You agree you said all those things? Absolutely. Okay. It's all bullshit. Wh which we could wrong? get into which one it. Of it reclaiming my time, sir. The fact that you said that, I could go through countless IPCC reports that make it very clear to the contrary. I could go through countless reports from our own financial regulators that there are risks. 
We could talk about the number of places in the world where the wet bulb temperature now regularly exceeds 35 degrees Celsius, 95F, which is beyond the ability of humans to live for more than six hours a time in India, Bangladesh, maybe not in your air-conditioned office. But this stuff is real. And I'm not gonna get into an argument with you because ultimately you don't matter. You are an interchangeable person who comes here and finds it useful to misrepresent science in order to create short-term value for your shareholders. There are thousands of people like you. You're gonna be forgotten years from now. Maybe your grandchildren will be embarrassed, I don't know. But what I know right now is that we have to act on this stuff. We are sitting here in a moment where we know these changes are happening, and I'm sympathetic with you in the narrow sense, Mr. Wright, that in the last 10 years, oil demand in the United States has not moved. Coal demand is down 40%. Natural gas demand has decoupled from GDP growth, and that's because renewables are surging. It's because EVs are surging. The markets are demanding things that you are not providing. Capitalism is hard, right? And when capitalism is hard, the worst thing in your world is that you might actually have informed investors. There's a reason why the whole oil and gas ENP sector is on a good day, lucky to get a 10 times earnings multiple, and the clean energy sector is running at 20, 30 times multiple. They're getting cheaper access to capital. Y'all are building an industry to export, to sell your product to places where people don't have access to capital. Maybe you don't care. Our job here is not to protect Liberty Energy investors. It is to protect markets. It is to protect all investors. It is to make sure that capitalism works. And I hope that someday that's not partisan, even if it is scientifically true. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair would just remind all of our members to uh, uh, display pr uh, proper decorum. Mr. Wright, we thank you for being with us as a witness today. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Laddlemilk, uh, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Wright. I'll start with you. Um, it, it is amazing to me of how some people here in this body are very selective with the science that they want to accept, right? I mean, we, we were wanting to follow the science with COVID. There's gender identity. There's, there's science that it seems that they want to selectively follow science. You were cut off, I think, rudely. And I had already written down, I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to, to respond to Mr. Kasten, but also to uh, Mr. Vargas, who asked the question about whether or not you believe in climate change, and you responded that that wasn't a fair question. So I want to give you a few moments to respond to both of those. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Congressman. Yeah, look, climate change and energy are just simply too important to get wrong, to make a bombastic uh, non-fact-based statements, They're very, which is why I say it's not about belief. It, it's become religion. That's very unfortunate. This is a science technical topic. We should study climate change, understand the risks there, understand the downsides, understand the upsides, and then look at our energy system. And ultimately, it's about what's the best set of trade-offs to make there. And what the world has done in the last two decades has actually been a pretty poor Pretty poor calculus in that. We've spent somewhere between four and $10 trillion, depending on how you want to count it, dominantly for wind and solar, which just crossed 2% of global energy. And everywhere they have large penetration, you have more expensive electricity and less stable grids. They're not threats to oil and gas. I, I, I feel zero threat whatsoever. I went to college to work on fusion energy at MIT. I worked on solar energy at UC Berkeley. I've worked on geothermal energy for 30 years. I'm not some partisan defending the oil and gas industry. I'm just a believer that energy matters. We still have two billion people cooking their daily meals, burning wood, dung, and agricultural waste. About three million deaths a year from that. And we're gonna stand in the way of them getting propane so they can have clean, long, healthy lives like us? Like, that's just crazy. And everything I said in that video, everything I said in that video is true and actually in the IPCC reports. So people that hear, people talk about them, or the summary from policymakers. So I'm very careful about that. This book that I think I sent to every member, including Representative Kasten, has all this data. It's all referenced. This isn't made up. This isn't denying for my industry. This is just being sober and honest about energy and climate change. Well, I appreciate that. And look, it's, 
it's political science here. The science that's accepted is based on what is good and popular politics, is what you find here in this building. Mr. Wright, while I have you, uh, real quickly, understand your company, Liberty Energy, successfully sued the SEC to stay the rule in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Then after the stay was lifted just last week, the SEC decided to voluntarily stay the rule on its own. Did the SEC's decision to change course come as a surprise to you? I'm not good at predicting those things, but I guess it was a surprise, a pleasant surprise. What, what was your reaction to the news based on the SEC's tone when just a few weeks earlier they were in court arguing against Liberty Energy's push to stay the rule? Yeah, again, I, I, I can't handicap that. I, I think the stay is a good thing. This issue should be litigated. We should decide what the right answer is, and we'll all live by the, the answer that comes down. Okay. Mr. Roisman, um, I'm concerned that the SEC is misleading the public about the impetus for their climate rule. The Commission has repeatedly asserted that the final rule's climate disclosures are a direct response to investor demand, but it's unclear who those investors even are and how useful the information required by the rule would be when making investment decisions. Is it possible the SEC is responding to some other pressure, such as pressure from activist groups to finalize the climate disclosure rule? I think this was certainly a concern raised by the two dissenting commissioners uh, about this being more political in nature than uh, substantive. Now, now, I think it should be noted there are investors who want this. Um, there's investors who don't want this. Uh, the test has always been the SEC is trying to provide information so people can make an informed investment decision, and that usually is tied to financial returns. One of the things that the dissenting commissioners talked about was that a lot of the proponents of the rule may have, uh, you know, may have sort of a focus on non-financial or uh, pecuniary returns. And that's perfectly fine, but that's not historically what the SEC does in terms of mandating disclosure. Real quickly, um, can you explain what the difference between having the companies file these disclosures that, that they were forced to do as opposed to furnishing them and why uh, that difference matters? The, the difference matters in terms of uh, liability risk, in terms of uh, plan of, of lawsuits and other litigation, sir. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, um, listening to my colleagues across the aisle, people might be, as they talk about the recent climate disclosure rule, the American people uh, might be inclined to believe that the SEC had no basis for taking on this issue and that there is no climate emergency. I think that's what uh, some people might refer to as uh, fake news. Uh, when, in fact, at the last hearing on providing transparency for investors by requiring climate disclosure, I was encouraged to hear SEC Chair Gensler confirm on the record that investors responded favorably to the proposed rule as it was previously designed. So the SEC understands that we must take action to protect our financial system. That is why I'm disappointed that the final rule is significantly weaker, it fails to fully deliver the information on scope three emissions that investors want, and this has consequences for millions of workers and families, whether it's personal retirement, or college savings for a child, investments are at greater risk due to this weakened rule. 97% of investor comments were in favor of the proposed rule that supported the inclusion of scope three. Ms. Fish, can you explain how folks would benefit from data on scope three emissions from US companies? Thank you, yes. Um, scope three emissions allow a company to assess what risks am I exposed to based on the regulation, the demands, the environmental impact on my customers, on my suppliers, on my employees, on the world in which I operate? So for example, to the extent that a company's supply chain is vulnerable, that's a material business risk, right? That's not, it doesn't matter how you feel about climate change. That's something that a company has to plan for. That's something that a company has to take into account. So, uh, for example, we get our water from a particular supplier, and that water supply is limited, is threatened, right? This might be a good time to diversify, 
Right? So investors need to understand those kinds of questions as well as the extent to which management is informing itself and making the hard choices. And the hard choices may or may not be to take a particular climate-oriented approach, but it's knowing the information and guiding your company so it's going to be sustainable in the future. Thank you. Ms. Fish, there are um, trillions of dollars implicated by the SEC climate disclosure rule, but my Republican colleagues want it to be even weaker. Do you agree that it should be a strong rule that helps our economy? I do, do believe it should be a strong rule. And I have to say, I am persuaded by some of Mr. Roisman's questions that to the extent the uh, SEC has limited some of the disclosures, that does reduce information in the market, that does reduce comparability. So a stronger rule would have, I think, been even better tailored to the SEC's goals of protecting the markets and investors. Very good. I'm calling on the SEC to reconsider its position to include climate risk disclosure on scope three emissions to protect investors and to safeguard our financial system. This is not the time to backtrack and to weaken regulations. This is the time to strengthen them. Thank you. I yield. General Lady yields. I now recognize myself for five minutes and begin by thanking Chairman McHenry and Ranking Member Waters for holding this hearing and a, and a particular thank you to our witnesses today. I know you volunteer your time to do this, and uh, we appreciate you sharing your expertise and uh, hope that uh, this, uh, you re regard this as a uh, productive and enjoyable enterprise. Three weeks ago, the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee visited Tennessee's sixth district, my district, to speak with regulatory victims of this rule. After that hearing, I was further determined to speak out against this rule and expose Chair Gensler's detrimental, what I believe is detrimental conduct. Mr. Wright, part of this awful rule, in my estimation, is the inclusion of Scope 2 disclosure requirements. This requirement would, of course, mean that publicly traded companies will have to disclose how much greenhouse gas is generated through their electricity usage. The execution of this will be especially problematic for publicly traded companies in Tennessee and in my district, Tennessee 6th. In Tennessee, the Tennessee Ballot Authority generates electricity and excuse me, it sells it to utility companies who then distribute the electricity to these publicly traded companies. This rule will mean that TVA must work with the distributors to ensure that companies are provided with accurate scope two figures. From your company's perspective, can you talk about the level of difficulty in producing these scope two disclosure reports and calculating the costs of energy generation? Yeah, I, I wish I knew the, a more accurate answer to that. But we, we do business in 12 states, you know, in all different rural areas, one-off jobs in, you know, out in Utah where there's not oil and gas, where we're doing work for geothermal. So it's all over the place. So, yeah, to think everywhere we source electricity from or heat or cooling or other energy sources, that, that will be very tricky to do. And, of course, we'll just be, we'll just be getting someone else's guesstimates of the numbers for our data to add to, to our own guesstimates. Sure, and I, and I would just say that the scope of this rule, in my view, is, is clearly intended to provide uh, information for blame and shame uh, exercises and, uh, you know, beyond the materiality requirements that have, have histor historically guided disclosure. Um, and it, it strikes me that if this is material, then everything is material, and if everything is material, then nothing uh, is informative for the, for the investing public. Mr. White, as a professor at Vanderbilt University, my alma mater, you are uh, likely aware that the state of Tennessee manages assets for public workers and retirees across the state. The managers of these funds are focused on maximizing returns, not social or political agendas. Is there any net financial benefit that public workers and retirees could expect to see in their assets or managed funds due to this rule? Yes, yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, certainly pension funds and retirement funds have a fiduciary duty to their uh, investors, and that is to maximize their returns so that they can use that money in retirement. To the extent that the cost of this rule outweighs the benefit, then that would be detrimental to them. Um, you know, the SEC has already got its 2010 climate guidance in terms of requiring material disclosures around climate. And so if that is material to registrants, they should already be disclosing it. 
which means that additional disclosure burdens would have limited benefits and thus impact uh, returns negatively. Thank you. I appreciate that and agree with your observations. Mr. White, could the fund uh, that public companies will have to, the funds that they will have to allocate towards compliance be better spent towards growth, fueling stronger returns for Tennesseans? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, I've got a study with Professor Craig Lewis also at Vanderbilt that looks at the 2012 Jobs Act and companies used compliance savings, which exempted them from costly provisions like Sarbanes-Oxley. They used that money instead of compliance by investing in their science. So every dollar that goes to compliance is a dollar that you're not investing for growth and returns. And so yes, it would impact them negatively. Thank you. Mr. Stebbins, as a lawyer myself and an investor myself, uh, I want to be extremely clear. Our, and I, I know this point's been made, but are public companies under the current materiality doctrine already required to report every piece of material information? Uh, that's been made very clear, I think, in the 2010 guidance and subsequently uh, in later, uh, many later statements from uh, the SEC whoever has been running the SEC at the time, Chairman Clayton, uh, Bill Hinman, the Corp Fin Director. So yes, it's extremely clear. Thank you, I appreciate that. I see my time is about to expire, and so I yield back and recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, for five minutes. Thank you to the Chairman, to the Ranking Member, and to our witnesses for your time uh, being before us today to discuss yet another manufactured culture war that has nearly nothing to do with the critical issues facing our country's financial systems. Unfortunately, we are here relitigating the same arguments over an unrelatable SEC rulemaking when we should be working on the issues that actually matter to our constituents. The majority seems wholly uninterested in tackling the hard questions that we face as a nation today. Anyone who's been to my district knows that the number one issue we face is the high cost of housing. To, to show just how dire this crisis has become, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a January article from the Las Vegas Review Journal titled, Las Vegas Home Prices Going Up Five Times Faster Than Wages. Without objection. This article outlines the particular painful point that according to recent Zillow data from 2011 to, to the end of 2022, home price growth in Southern Nevada has far outpaced wage growth in the same time frame. It is such a pressing crisis for folks in my state because Nevada led the country over that time frame with an astounding six-fold increase in the ratio of home prices to wages. Six-fold over an 11-year period. However, this should surprise no one given that Nevada is already short approximately 80,000 units of housing that is affordable. And the volume of home sales has bottomed out at their lowest since 2008. These are real challenges that demand real solutions. And yet my colleagues across the aisles, aisle have none. The housing legislation that they've posted for our most recent markup would have nothing to do to address these skyrocketing costs. And one bill would actually make it easier for landlords to evict their tenants. Their lack of interest in finding answers to these questions is why we are holding hearing after hearing to debate the merits of climate change instead of debating the merits of the necessary fixes to the housing market that my colleagues and I have advanced. Everyday Nevadans are in the fight of their lives and unfortunately they are fed up against some of the wealthiest and sophisticated investors in the country. It's time for us to stand up for the people. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a Nevada Independent article titled, It's Time to Take Back Our Housing from Wall Street. Without objection. The reality for our communities is a stark one. As this article points out, displacement is the norm in our communities. North Las Vegas residents regularly confront exorbitant rates, soaring housing costs, tenant exploitation, and eventually eviction notices. Last year, I had the opportunity to see firsthand just how destructive these abuses can be when I was able to attend an eviction proceeding at the North Las Vegas Justice Court on behalf of my constituents. Out-of-state corporate investors are preying 
on the most vulnerable among us, and we need broad federal legislation to address the issue and hold these firms accountable for their unfair abuses that they impose upon our communities. But we can only do that, Mr. Chairman, if we hold meaningful hearings to debate the merits of potential solutions. Potential so solutions like My Home Act, which would empower HUD to curb the very worst of the predatory behaviors that we see in the housing market today. Don't take my word for it. Come to my district and hear for yourselves. Stories from people like Katrina Paul. Katrina has been working with her realtor to finally achieve the dream of home ownership. However, she's been thwarted every turn. 18 offers. Katrina has made 18 offers on homes during the recent surge in Las Vegas' housing market, and she has been outbid on every single one. She has been outbid by cash buyer after cash buyer, and through no fault of her own, she is forced to continue to rent an apartment that is too small. Her only dream, like so many across this country, is the dream of finally owning her own home. This story is far too common across Southern Nevada, where hardworking people are stuck making rent payments each month when they should be investing in the equity that helps to build wealth for themselves and their family. So for people like Katrina, they will continue to be forced to delay that dream and that wealth if they are ever able to have it come true at all. So Mr. Chairman, I just ask you, out of respect for my constituents, to prioritize my legislation and those of my colleagues dealing with housing affordability and let's address the crisis that's before our constituents now in this Congress. The gentleman needs to respect the time. I yield back gentleman. my time. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today to discuss the recently finalized climate disclosure rule. Time and time again, the Biden administration has leveraged so-called independent regulators to achieve political goals they can't accomplish through Congress. And SEC Chair Gary Gensler may just be President Biden's most effective tool in this strategy, promulgating rules that turn our capital markets on their heads in order to promote inflation-driving Green New Deal policies rather than reinforce uh, their heads in order to promote uh, inflation-driving Green New Deal policies rather than reinforcing their fiduciary duty to create wealth for investors. It's quite evident that all investors are united by their shared concern for financial return and are divided on how important they consider non-economic factors such as climate change. By requiring extensive climate-related dis disclosures, the SEC has opened the door for activists to lobby for the mandatory disclosure of, of other non-economic information. There are a multitude of concerns with the SEC's recent efforts to influence the way company uh, boards and management operate. For example, the recently finalized cybersecurity rule requires detailed, potentially non-material risk management and governance disclosures to dictate the way companies should handle cyber risk. The climate rule goes even further, requiring management and boards to make complex judgments about climate risks, some of which are admittedly not material. Uh, Mr. Roisman, would you explain what problems arise when regulators impose overly prescriptive requirements relating to board governments, uh, governance and risk management? Thank you for the question. I, I think this sort of stems from the, the idea of do you continue a principles-based disclosure regime where companies are in the best position to tell investors what they think is material, and then when regulators say provide line item disclosures about each one. The, the problem you allude to I've heard to before, which is sometimes called the federalization of corporate governance, where by requiring regulations to disclose things about boards and management, are you trying to push boards and management to act in a certain way? Um, and with the cyber rule and both in the climate rule, in the proposal, there was this concept that you needed to disclose the, the expertise on the board with respect to cyber or to climate. And both were struck out of the final rule, uh, but some of the comments that people received or that the SEC received of this was, are you essentially telling us that we need to have a climate expert or a cyber expert on the board? Um, because there's many reasons to be on a board. So I think the concern people have is if you require some of these disclosures, are, you know, is this in effect trying to effectuate change? And the SEC is a disclosure agency. It's not uh, an agency that's supposed to dictate uh, how companies act. 
Sure, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, in a paper uh, titled The Economics of ESG Disclosure Regulation, your former colleague, uh, Dr. Qatari, suggests that climate-related financial risks are not as significant as other risks, such as interest rate ri risks, uh, inflation risk, recession risks, and many others, where granular uh, pres prescriptive disclosures are not mandated. Does the climate rule risk misleading investors into believing uh, climate risks are more significant than other risks? I think that is uh, a concern that's been raised that, uh, you know, Commissioner Peirce raised it in her uh, dissent. And I think the, uh, the concern is that as, uh, I want to call him Commissioner Roisman uh, next to me, uh, just mentioned that you're trying to push certain behaviors, right, as opposed to dysregulating by requiring uh, disclosures of certain things, you're, you're trying to push boards uh, and companies to act in a certain way rather than just doing what they know they consider to be in the best interest of the shareholders, and they certainly know better than the regulatory agency. I think that would be the, uh, the main concern with that. And then also I think Commissioner Peirce mentions, uh, so today it's climate, what's next? Right? That's her, what's the next social issue? Well, and I, I'm going to follow up on that. Does this not disadvantage U.S. businesses in the global, in the global markets? Because businesses in foreign countries other than Europe um, don't have these additional requirements, and they're focused on a return on the investment, not uh, other variables that are not core to their business function. So is this going to create a, a challenge for U.S. businesses to compete in the global economy? Uh, I think uh, unquestionably it does. I think that that is a major problem, and um, my district has been the victim to uh, federal policy that has sent tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs overseas, and we need to focus on competing the global economy, and this administration is on the wrong track. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. We're Getting right there to it, so y'all just keep keep holding. Well, here we are again. I think this is the sixth uh, hearing we've had on the SEC and the twelfth on climate change. I'm hearing a lot of more of the same as we continue to debate whether climate risk is a financial risk. The climate crisis continues to get, to get worse, and consumers are paying the price because it goes on and on. Families and hardworking Americans in my district are dealing with insurance company withdrawals insurance cancellations and premium spikes in Texas. In fact, Mr. Chairman, I was stunned uh, during our two week break because my own health uh, homeowner's insurance went to about, it was about $9,500. I got a bill for 13,600. That's a huge spike. So anybody that tells me uh, that the weather uh, does not impact uh, climate change needs to come to Houston, uh, where we have suffered from hurricanes, flooding, storms, one last night, uh, f uh, freezes. Uh, so this whole notion that it, it isn't real to me is just, it's just dumbfounding. In fact, even the recent fire in Texas cost the ranchers at least $102 million. Millions and millions of acres were on fire. So I, I, you know, investors are clamoring for these climate disclosures. I've heard it. I know that people in my district, even though they're not investors, um, uh, are clamoring for it. These disclosures not only promote better transparency to inform consumers and investors, but also help the industry track their environmental, social, and corporate governance goals. So Professor Fitch, I keep hearing the sky is falling because this is going to happen. Companies are going to leave. They're not going to invest. They're not going to do all these things. Is there any real data to really support that? I mean, it, don't, don't, you, don't you see investors demanding this, this climate disclosure as I have? Absolutely. And part of the reason uh, the SEC's final release was so long is because the SEC, uh, which is, you know, deeply... Uh, immersed in the market and in deep conversations with investors was summarizing the thousands of investor comments saying we need this information and explaining why this information is important. 
And I should just say that the investor's perspective, by and large, is that this in information is important to our financial assessment. Now, sure, investors can invest for a variety of different reasons, but the large investors, the institutional investors, they're saying this information is financially material. This helps us uh, investigate. Is the company going to lose its insurance coverage? Is a company going to lose physical assets to a flood or other event? And again, we don't have to debate. Is it human cost? Is it climate change? Or is it just some random flood? The point is, these are business risks. This is economic vulnerability that investors are demanding. And I should just say, you know, the discussion earlier about that the SEC should prevent companies from disclosing scope three emissions. Uh, number one, if there's any First Amendment problem, the idea that the SEC would tell companies you can't disclose what the market wants, what your investors want, to me that's just incredible. The other, you know, is disclosure is designed to facilitate the market responding and evaluating this information. This is not some heavy-handed merit-based regulation. This is, look, you know, we've got these capital markets. Investors say they need this. Let's give them what they want. Right. And, and do, you, do, you, do you have any data on the number of investors who did file comment letters and how many of them uh, supported climate change and, some, and how many didn't? Well, I mean, you know, the, you know, thousands of comment letters, how you quantify it depends a little bit on whether you're looking at individual comment letters or they're in this kind of thing. There are a lot of form letters as well. But basically, you know, 99% of the investors said we support scope one and two emissions, 97 disclosure, 97% said we support scope three emissions disclosure. And the numbers are just overwhelmingly okay. high. Now, something else caught my ear that one of my colleagues said earlier, and, 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 and that was... As a as a layperson, uh, you know, I was a little offended. It almost sounded like they think that these disclosure requirements are too complicated and too high level for the average investor to understand. The non institutional, the the retail investor. So, what's your reaction to that? Do you not think that the average person understands that climate change issues, higher risks, we should know about it? I think to me, it seems simple. I think there's a whole range of retail investors out there with different levels of understanding. There are financial uh, reporters, there are securities analysts that can help investors understand that information. There are intermediaries like asset managers that can help investors, right? But at the end of the day, right, investors are entitled to this information. They're entitled to use whatever resources are available to them to evaluate the information, and they're entitled to invest according to their preferences. Not very complicated, is it? No. Thank you. I yield back. General Lady's time has expired. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to dive back into materiality because I think we're, we're missing what might be one of the most important topics here today, and we're, we're speaking past. I listened to you, uh, Professor Fish, and you said, I think, something along the lines of the, the investors want to give them what they want. And then you cited a study, I think, that reviewed 320 institutional investors, and then you come up with 97%. It's an incredibly small sample uh, of people. I would say what people really want is material information. Rather than allowing activist investors or the loudest voices in the room to dictate what is or what is not disclosed, because as noted through today's conversation, the disclosure process is incredibly expensive and time-consuming. There's an appropriate need for that, if it's material. But if it's not material, it's simply an activity to abate those that want it, in, in your term, right? Those that want it. You would say, as I listen to you, give them what they want. Is that, do you, do you concern yourself with whether or not the, the, the information quote that they want is material, yes or no? Does materiality matter to you in this context? Materiality absolutely matters to me. So the, okay, so great. So so it matters to you. So should it be definitive as to whether or not the information is disclosed? It's a core tenet of securities law. Do you believe that if the if the information is not material, that it is therefore not material and does not need to be disclosed? Well, I guess I'm not. No, no, no. Just yes or no. Do you do you think if it's material, it matters? I, I guess I don't think that materiality is as clear a binary as you're suggesting. So right? you would so throw, so no, so it's, well, it's pretty darn clear, right? There's plenty of securities case law 
on this point and topic. There are significant boardroom discussions on this. Every securities law attorney goes through a thorough process with public companies to determine whether or not an information is material or not. This is heavily litigated. It is, it is very clear. There's plenty of case law on the topic. I, I would, it would encourage you to read further into this, but, but let's step one step further. If it is or is not material, does it need to be disclosed? Well, the Supreme Court case law is but in the do context you think, of securities fraud. And do you securities think, fraud is different from the SEC's no, you can, uh, you power can sue on somebody's, You could sue on somebody's on filings for lack of disclosure. And so what I'm asking you is, do you think that the, the information needs to be material? Do I think which information needs to be material? Any, you think the SEC should require people to provide information that's not material to investors? Is think, that your position? I think the SEC has done that and, and will And you think they should in this case? I, I think the SEC has a long tradition. I'm not asking about their tradition. I'm asking whether or not you think, I'm, I'm asking a very clear question, ma'am. I'm asking whether or not you think the information, if it's not material, should still be disclosed. Yes or no? I think the information has a long history. I'm not asking about the history, ma'am. So, so notice, Notice to those watching this, we're going to ask one more time because it's a very clear question. If it's, if it's not material, does, should it be required to be disclosed? It's a simple question. Well, this, this rule doesn't require any disclosure of non-material information. Okay, so, so let's, let's pause there. Let's, let's, okay, so, so, so you would say, if I'm hearing you, because you're really fighting to not say that you, you want non-material information to be disclosed, because now you're saying it's material. If it's not material, is it correct that you are okay it not being disclosed because it's not material? No, I didn't say that. I'm at, right, so I'm trying to dialogue. So right. yes or no, non-material information needs to be disclosed, I in think, your opinion. I think there are any number of... So you, can't, uh, so, so you can't even give me a yes or no opinion. Why? Because materiality is the cornerstone of securities law. And if you have a background in securities law, it's really tough to say on the record that you want non-material information to be required to be disclosed. And so when we hear this time and again from my colleagues on the left, they want non-material information to be disclosed all the time. We've seen HR policies put forward. We have seen policies as it relates to climate put forward. Those of us on the right, we agree when those policies are material, they should be disclosed. So if you're Exxon, there's probably a materiality threshold and you should probably put it forward. If you're an HR consulting company, it's probably not material. It probably doesn't need to be disclosed. But there's those on the left that want to play to their activists, are unconcerned about the economic burden being passed on to every consumer in the United States of America, and have no problem that through red tape we drive inflation higher, we discourage U.S. companies from going public, and on the record, a simple yes or no question, we've seen it refuse to be answered at least four times, beyond frustrating. It's why we have to continue to fight against non-material information from being required to satisfy activist investors. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields. Gentleman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Professor Fish, how are you? How are you? Yeah. Um, you know, I think so many people always forget how many times the American taxpayer has bailed out folks for just really hiding the truth from the public, especially in areas that we know are risks. And we can agree. Uh, Folks want to agree, but they actually don't want to do anything about it, that climate risk is a financial risk. I mean, I, my community, I cannot tell you how many times we've had floods. You know, they say this is record floods, record floods. I'm like, I don't know, this is four in a row. Um, but, but, but we continue to say, well, let's do nothing. But then when these financial institutions making these real huge risks, putting really our economy at risk, we bail them out. We bail them out instead of telling them to do what's right, which is providing information so that we can make much more informed decisions about whether or not. So if your company has gone all in and an outdated business model, uh, then workers who have put their savings into a company deserve to know that. I mean, this is something that I, I, just, not, I just cannot understand um, why folks, because if, if I know Europe and others, I mean, I just don't understand why we are so hesitant in doing it other than the fact that they don't want to consider this a risk because they know that for them, they'll just get bailed out by the United States, that we, the American taxpayer, would just bail them out. That's exactly what we continue to do. And you all know it. You do. We always do. 
when they don't tell us the truth or they're hiding or they're not disclosing what is necessary for us to make those informed decisions. Professor Fish, can you explain what climate-related physical and transition risks are and provide some examples? So uh, climate-related physical and transition risks, and I have several examples in my written remarks, yep. include things like uh, the vulnerability of physical assets to what you just said, to floods, to extreme weather events. Uh, last week in Philadelphia, we had an earthquake, and yep. so everyone went around and inspected the buildings to see if they were structurally sound, right? That's, that's a physical risk um, that uh, a company might have to take into account. Um, transition risks include responding to whether you think there are climate-related risks, whether you think there are regulatory risks, whether your cost of power or uh, the sources of power that you're entitled to use are going to go up, whether natural resources like water supply uh, are going to be vulnerable, yeah. right? Those are all risks that companies, any company. So we're talking about transparency. Yes. Yeah. Professor Fish, does the SEC rule require companies to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions or install solar panels, anything like that, or yeah. simply talking about Right? They're not asking them to do that, right? Absolutely not. And in They're fact, talking about to just disclose. Yes. Right? right? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure, because folks are saying that, and that's not truthful. I'd like to turn now to concerns about compliance costs. That's another one. This is interesting. We're talking about companies that just have a ton of money. And again, we just bail them out. <laughs> uh, the Wall Street Journal has reported that roughly 3,000 U.S. companies will have to make disclosures comply with the European Union's Corporate Sustainability Reporting uh, Directive. Professor Fish, can you compare the EU's reporting standards with those in SEC's final rule? Which reporting framework is more demanding? Oh, well, the European standards are way more demanding. It's reporting not just on climate-related re risks, yeah. but a broader stretch of environmental risks. It's reporting on other sustainability issues as well. The European reporting system will require disclosure of scope one, two, and three emissions. Mm -hmm. It will require disclosure not limited by uh, economic materiality, materiality to investors. Europe applies. And some a double of those companies are the same ones we're asking. So they just, uh, I'm not trying to simplify it, when they just have to copy what they're already providing the EU. Well, a substantial number of the uh, US yes. companies are going to be subject to that regime, yes. So, com okay. Because they're already required, because they're complaining about compliance costs. And I'm like, don't you have to do the report for the EU, which is much more demanding? Yes. I don't know. I, maybe I'm oversimplifying this for folks. Um, California has adopted two laws requiring large companies to disclose their climate-related financial risks and greenhouse gas emissions. Professor Fish, how do reporting requirements of SB 253 and uh, 261 compare with SEC, SEC's climate rule? Well, again, those uh, reporting requirements are more demanding than the SEC standard. A yeah. uh, lot of companies that would be subject to the SEC rule will have to comply with the California rule, whether or not the SEC adopted its current rule. And I should note that California's rule extends to private companies as well. So what we heard all earlier about how these compliance costs are going to drive companies into the private markets, right? That's not true for Europe. Mm -hmm. That's not true for California. Um, I know that Reuters reports that roughly 5,000 companies will have to comply with SB 253, while approximately about 10,000 companies will be subject to SB 261. Another analyst, they found that 73% of Fortune 1,000 companies will be covered by both laws. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that's right, yes. yes. Thank you. I yield. Gentlelady yields. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you for the panelists for coming. Um, Ms. Fish, let me get back on what um, Mr. Steyer, Congressman Steyer has mentioned about materiality and what's not. Uh, in one of the, I guess, footnotes uh, in this 886-page rule is the word severe weather events and other natural conditions. Is that a material risk? So I think the uh, qualifier of severe is a pretty clear indicator that the SEC intends to limit this to material. material risks. Yes. Okay, if I, on my statement, put uh, these are my insurance costs for hurricane risk, for flooding risk, let that light item go, would that satisfy the SEC? Uh, I'm not sure I follow the question. No, in trying to comply with this rule, would SEC take the statement to answer that particular footnote, the cost to my company uh, is the insurance that I buy that stockholders ultimately pay I don't think the SEC's requirement is even that demanding. I think what the SEC is saying is if you suffer a hurricane or an earthquake and your building falls down, you've got to disclose that cost, right? Companies, 
engage in a high degree of planning, insurance, and so forth. And get that's all that. required by the SEC rule. But it wouldn't take more than one sentence. This is my insurance cost. This covers the risk that you're talking about. Does the risk include, would that, we have to include forest fires? Well, I think the point of severe weather events is to make it, or, or other natural conditions, is so that companies wouldn't have to parse that line drawing. Is, is a forest fire a weather event, or is it some other severe condition, right? I don't know if that's true for earthquakes. I don't know if that's true for, um, you know, tornadoes and so forth. So I guess, you know, the SEC is just trying to uh, simplify that decision for companies. They, they haven't simplified it. That's a, that's a nebulous, I mean, how do you define that? I mean, how do you answer what the SEC wants? I would just answer it in my company. This is my cost, insurance cost, yes or no. And I think that would make sense. Are you tenured? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Wright, are you tenured? I am not. I am not. Oh, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> no, Mr. Wright. Sorry. I am not. What's the difference in your, in your line of work and in, Ms. F in, in Dr. Fish? Ah, it's just a different world. I'm in the commercial space, she's in the academic space. And in the academic space, when you're tenured, your tenured results on performance and what you, uh, you know, how you, for, for uh, Liberty Energy, you're on a different set of scales, you look at it differently. Uh, how would you, in your opinion, if I ask you to have to answer the financial, I mean, the, the, the severity of weather events and trying to describe it, what would you put? What would I prefer? I mean, it would have been nice if they'd spell out what right. other physical events are. Um, it's nebulous, and I don't know how you answer that. We major in the minor up here, and it's political science up here with my good friends on the left. The, the, the diatribe that you heard about from Mr. Horseman, we actually agree. I'm in the housing business. Prices are way up. Now, his answer is higher taxes and more regulations. My answer is maybe start drilling, maybe buying oil and gas uh, from our from America instead of foreign countries that don't like us, maybe cut regulations, maybe cut the cost of the illegal immigration that's coming all over this country and the $4,000 we're giving each one of them and a driver's license and a phone. Maybe that would cut the cost instead of higher taxes and, um, and what's happening to this country. Uh, I admire your courage when you did not raise your hand about the climate change. Do you believe in climate change? That's a totally backward question. Uh, and, you know, I'll let you further respond to that. I know you were asked about that. Yeah, it, it just the expression implies faith. You know, it's, it's climate change isn't religion. I, 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 I've written multiple books showing the data about climate change. So to me, climate, climate change is a physical phenomenon we should seek to understand with the real data, not the sensationalized data. And, and when we show data, we show data sets from start to the end. We don't, we don't cherry pick, we don't look at it. It's a real thing, it's a global phenomenon, but a sober understanding of it is just critical. Uh, you know, and, and climate change is, is uh, and emissions are the same thing too. What's the best way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Ultimately, it's just gonna be technology. Lower, the biggest driver of US reduced greenhouse gas emissions been natural gas displacing coal. You know. Are we uh, able to control hurricanes and uh, uh, no. earthquakes? So no. that being, a, we can't control that. And to say otherwise, the facts don't bear that out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman. General Yates, I now recognize myself for five minutes. So, uh, Mr. Wright, I liked what you just said at the end. Technology is the, uh, the answer here. I think we are all conservationists. Uh, heck, I would characterize myself as an environmentalist at this point. That's kind of your business, clean energy, right? You don't come in and with all your equipment, your technology, and all your R&D investment. It's good business for you. It's good business for those you're doing business with. It's good business for my former company. I mean, now we, you know, the lights shut off when you come in. When, and it, employees like it. It's a, it's a social trend that, you know, to, to, my, to some of my, maybe my colleagues here in the house, and certainly the regulators, the private sector, is minimizing carbon emissions far more with, without the regulatory burdens, far more than the regulators or, or this, this Congress uh, would do. Um, and, and, and I'll ask you though, that's your business. How much of your R&D expense goes into minimizing carbon emissions? 
actually quite a bit. Our, our big single biggest R&D and capital expenditure effort has been to convert, you know, we have over two million horsepower of equipment. To get oil and gas from underground takes energy to push it down. So typically, large industrial machinery is powered by diesel. That's the dominant industrial right. fuel around the world. And we're moving that to a new generation of equipment that burns natural gas. Yeah. And not just natural gas, but at the highest thermal efficiency possible to Beautiful. use the smaller. Has the SEC or the regulators come to you and say, hey, you got any ideas on, on some of the best rules that we should be implementing here? No. And do you think the same regulators that want to attack you uh, and, and attack our domestic energy industry, let's, let's just face it. I mean, they, they literally choose Venezuela over my home state of Pennsylvania uh, for, for natural gas. Do you think some of them use electricity, oil, gasoline on occasion? Quite likely. Yeah, probably. You know, here, here and there, I'm sure. And uh, far, far less than, 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 than us, of course. So meanwhile, you have an SEC that with, with, with this rule, and I don't, I, look, the, the rule's the rule, the rule but, but we're okay to have complaints about it or issues about it, or, you know, you always want to make a plan better. So, but it's targeted who I hear back from the real world, the real world who I talk to in industry dealing with complying with these plethora of rules coming out of the SEC. The, prob the real problems are the ener energy industry, which you're used to, I mean, because you're just under regular assault, uh, being a USA flagship energy industry makes you a terrible person. Uh, and, and, and farmers, the farmers are the ones being concerned here. And by the way, where's inflation hitting most? Energy and groceries. So isn't this wonderful that we're dealing with something here that's going to inflate the inflationary uh, situation that my uh, constituents uh, deal with, particularly low-income uh, constituents, uh, that can't even afford the groceries and the gasoline. So, so how damaging uh, to, is, the, is some of these? Some, I'm going to stick with you for a moment, Mr. Wright. How, how damaging and, and is there a better way uh, we, we could go about some of this compliance and minimizing emissions and truly trying to work together to gain as much a, a clean energy in a tr best transition uh, manner sooner rather than later other than these rules? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know, I think there's a passion in the country. We've seen some of that today right. and around the world about, I, I say the world needs more energy, better energy. And uh, U.S. has certainly been a leader in that. Our industry is a leader of that. It's mostly rural people that grew up on the land. We want to shrink our footprint on the land. We want to make the air cleaner. We want to use less energy to produce energy um, and produce cheaper energy. Okay. You know, I always say, I celebrate, the thing I celebrate the shale revolution the most is it lowered the cost of oil, natural gas, and natural gas liquids, and that makes people's lives better. So Marketplaces you, drive improvement, lower costs. Okay. So you you think the SEC has uh, uh, overstepped its authority here with this regulation? I absolutely believe okay. so. I'm going to move on to uh, uh, former SEC uh, Chairman uh, Roisman. What do you think? What would you have done here? So they didn't ask me, uh, but uh, if you're asking me now, I, I think that the rules in place make sense. It's a materiality standard. If you had concerns that it wasn't enough, you can update the 2010 guidance, and that would have been a very simple thing and probably a lot less controversial. And would have been more acceptable to industry, because God forbid this administration do anything that industry and our economy actually appreciates, as opposed to add in regulation and burdens. But you think it would be more acceptable to industry? I, I, I do. Okay. I, uh, my, my time has expired. Uh, I now um, offer the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino. He is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all the witnesses uh, uh, for being here today. Uh, in a challenging global economy, the strength of our capital markets is vital to long-term economic growth. However, rising costs and increased regulatory burdens prevent some businesses from entering our public markets. The SEC's newly finalized climate rule would just pile on to the rising costs associated with the company going and remaining public. The SEC estimates, estimates that the rule will increase the typical cost of being a public company by 21%. This doesn't include the indirect costs associated with the rule, such as loss management time, board distraction, and changes in company operations. Professor White, would you explain what impact such a sudden, significant increase in compliance costs will have on public companies? 
Yeah, so, you know, for the companies that are already public uh, producing this, if they spend more time meeting compliance rather than focusing on the growth of their business, then that can destroy value for their investors. For companies that are thinking about going public, um, I would expect it to limit those companies from doing so, which is going to trickle down and hurt investors because they have fewer opportunities to diversify their portfolio, they have fewer investments that they can make, which can damage their returns, and it also harms market liquidity, so it can actually hurt all investors. That was my, actually my next question was, what was it going to do to private companies? Think about going public. Probably keep them from, most of them going public, yeah. Um, so what impact will these costs, both for private and public companies, have on American competitives? competitiveness? Would you expect companies to be, begin to incorporate, increase their activities in jurisdictions where similar costs are not required? Yeah, I mean, you think about going public and where to um, operate, uh, you know, both in the U.S. and globally now. We compete against companies all over the world. And so if a jurisdiction offers you better terms in terms of being public, lower cost, but you still get access to investor capital um, and liquid markets, then you would migrate to those jurisdictions, which could end up having both tax revenue leave the United States as well as human capital and really high-skilled technologies. So at a time when we're trying to bring manufacturing, all sorts of jobs back into the country, a lot of investment has gone into that, a lot of uh, legislation has been passed to try to get that. This rule created by the SEC, not, not Congress, outside of the SEC's jurisdiction, could end up causing us to lose jobs and capital to other places across the, uh, across the world. Yeah, that's the incentives. Yeah. Um, Staying on the uh, subject of increased costs, Mr. Wright, you mentioned in your testimony how liberty is subject to climate rule and imminent, imminent, imminently faces compliance costs to meet the rule's reporting timelines. You go on to mention how the rule will make energy production more expensive by driving up compliance costs and making conditions more difficult for investment. Would you summarize what new costs your company must incur to successfully comply with the rule and specifically how these costs will be more problematic for a smaller public company than larger public companies. Yeah, and of course, we, we don't know the number today, but you know we look at it as similar to Sarbanes-Oxley. We probably spend somewhere between a half million and a million dollars in third-party costs to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley. What was that number? Half. Somewhere between a half and a million dollars. A million dollars. Um, and our expectation was this would be similar. Uh, my, my fear is it would be worse because we're counting something that's ultimately not precisely countable. So where do we draw that line of a good enough guesstimate? Um, I worry, which is one of my bigger problems. It's just the uncertainty around the ability to even deliver these numbers. Um, where we drive greenhouse gas emissions by innovations, by equipment. We talk about this stuff all the time. I mean, our big picture progress in greenhouse gas emissions is pretty well known to investors, employees in our company. This distracts from that effort, and we, we, we've, we've got to count something that's not perfectly quantifiable. That's unsettling to me. Yeah, I, was, I actually was at COP this year, and uh, oil and gas companies spend a lot of time there talking about what they've already done to lower greenhouse uh, uh, emissions. So uh, us doing something on a regulatory uh, environment or putting another regulatory burden on these companies that would actually uh, take away from that, I think is just a terrible idea and actually is counteractive to what, uh, what the SEC is trying to do here but doesn't have the authority to do it. You, I, I, we've seen plenty of leadership from um, uh, U.S. companies, especially gas and uh, oil companies, to, to do uh, right by greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I'm running out of time, so I want to thank you for all for your answers, and I yield back. I'm now going to recognize myself for five minutes. Among the specific requirements in the rule, the required disclosures for greenhouse gas emissions data stand out as especially burdensome. These reporting requirements do not track with what is currently tracked by companies and when that information can be reliably reported. Uh, the exemption for smaller reporting companies, SRCs, is far too narrow and this rule will impact many smaller and medium-sized manufacturers, which make up the substantial share of businesses, uh, certainly in uh, my fifth district. Uh, and as you know, even with a limited safe harbor in place, the SEC acknowledges that the climate rule will expose companies to increased litigation risk. Uh, I'm concerned that uh, the, the risk will prevent companies from going or remaining public. Mr. Stebbins, would you explain why climate rules, limited safe harbor is not enough to protect companies 
against increased litigation risks? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I know the, uh, the, the safe harbor only covers certain select disclosures, and it doesn't cover historical facts. And those disclosures are primarily going to be uh, comprised of historical facts. And a leading law firm recently wrote a memo about the adopting release, and they concluded, or they advised, that you should not give too much credence to that safe harbor because of the fact that, because it's typically going to be based on, used, used by historical facts. That's going to be your disclosure. So they advised, don't give it too much credence. And I agree with that advice. I think that's sound. Very good. Proponents of the final rule often argue that climate-related disclosures are necessary in response to the demands of investors. However, I'm concerned that the SEC has finalized the rule not to the benefit of investors, but instead to placate activists who consider climate-related objectives important. Rather than focusing on the financial interests of the shareholders, this idea of stakeholder capitalism that some companies have embraced comes off as more of a PR stunt to evade the actual accountability. Shareholder rights are well-defined, but if a company has the obligation to a nebulous group of stakeholders, it's ultimately not accountable to anyone. Uh, Mr. Rossman, uh, would you explain why these activists may be better understood as stakeholders and not as investors? So uh, when people talk about stakeholders, it, as you mentioned, it's not just stockholders. Um, it can be uh, your customers, it can be your employees, it can be the community, it can be government. Uh, it's not just the people who own your company. And one of the concerns that some of the dissenting commissioners had about this uh, was that uh, these rules may be crafted more to satisfy stakeholders than the Main Street investor uh, that historically the SEC thought. Very good. Chairman Gensler often hides kind of behind this argument that the SEC, uh, many rulemakings are authorized by Congress and has said that as he's testified in front of Congress, believe it or not. However, a study analyzed the SEC's rulemaking agenda under his tenure found that 39 rule proposals, or approximately 80%, were not required by congressional statute. Many of the proposals overlap and could have unintended consequences that risk undermining our capital markets. Um, probably a good example is the proposals to change beneficial ownership and securities-based swaps uh, and their disclosures, and how that may impair liquidity. Uh, this could lead to uh, harmful activities, uh, such as front running or uh, diminish corporate governance checks and balances, I guess you could say. Mr. Stebbins, uh, can you discuss the, uh, the authority the SEC is relying on for the climate rule and your thoughts on whether they even have this authority in the first place? Um, they're relying on their uh, general investor protection authority. Uh, there's no specific authority for this rule. Um, they clearly have the authority to pass laws uh, related to the environment because they, do, they have them already relating to, uh, based on the investor protection authorization, you could regulate environmental risks. We still make that disclosure already. It's already required. So all material environmental risks are already required to be disclosure, disclosed. The question is, does that authority let you do this law? I don't, I don't think it's gonna be held up. Uh, I, don't, I think the uh, Supreme Court of the Eighth Circuit uh, is likely to find it to be a violation of the major questions doctrine, but that's for the court to decide, not for me. Very good, my time has expired. We're now gonna move on to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Kim. Thank you, Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today for long hours. Um, you know, I want to talk about uh, my concern that regulations proposed by SEC Chair Gensler will increase compliance costs and disincentivize private companies from going public. According to a recent CNN article, there were 7,300 publicly traded companies in the United States in 1996, and today there is 4,300. That is a significant decrease. I'm troubled by the SEC's own estimates that this rule we're discussing today 
will increase costs of being a public company by 21%. Mr. Roisman, uh, in your testimony, you discussed the complexities of considering foreign and state regulatory regimes on top of SEC's proposal. Unfortunately, my home state of California is the only state mandating disclosure of three scope emissions. Uh, so can you elaborate on that difficulties and the cost that public companies will have to bear to comply with different rules from multiple jurisdictions? Sure, so I, I think the SEC makes it clear that undoubtedly costs will rise as a result of this. Even if companies are tracking this information right now, it's very different to track and collect it to be put into an SEC filing which is subject to a, a higher litigation or, or more likely litigation. In terms of scope three, or scope two even, there are essentially provisions within the rule that says you need to take into account if you are subject to material sort of regulatory risk because you're disclosing information due to a California law or a European law. Uh, and you're gonna have to take that into account in making a materiality assessment. I think some of the concerns people are saying, and I think Mr. Wright did a very good job of explaining this, some of these numbers are, are just not easy to come up with. Um, I'm not in the industry, I'm just a lawyer, um, but the level of uh, sort of compliance and outside expertise that's gonna be needed in order for me to advise clients um, mm -hmm. uh, that the, what they're doing is sufficient for being able to put the stuff into their SEC filings is high. And, you know, even people are doing it right now, I'm not sure they're ready for that. Thank you. I, you know, both Mr. Roisman and Mr. Stebbins, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to a few arguments uh, that those on my colleagues on the other side of the uh, aisle have made throughout the hearing. Uh, specifically, we've been hearing that the SEC's rule is somehow weak or preferred because the California and European requirements extend to scope three emissions and apply to private companies. So first, can you remind us if California should set federal securities policy? And two, could you explain what the difference is from a litigation risk perspective between complying with European disclosure requirements versus including climate-related information in SEC filings? Either one of you? I'm guessing I'm gonna start. Um, so I think the, the role of the SEC or Congress is the mm -hmm. place to set federal, uh, both federal laws and federal rules. Uh, to your question about is there a difference between uh, complying with state and European regulators, there's absolutely a difference. Um, and especially with Europe. What people often forget is there is not the litigation risk for companies in Europe that there is in the United States for putting things in their filings. So uh, I, I do think companies need to stand behind what they say. But there's a difference between putting something in a voluntary mm -hmm. report than it is into your SEC filings. Okay. Um, do you want to add to that, Mr. Stebbins, or should we go on? Okay. I think we should move on. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about uh, my legislation, the REG Act. Considering the SEC under Chairman Gensler, uh, SEC is failing to assess the aggregate cost of regulations in a proper way. So I introduced HR 7030, the REG Act, to require SEC to consider the cumulative effects of every rulemaking. So I want to ask this question to Professor White. The SEC's cost-benefit analysis notably fails to account for the ways in which rules interconnect. It also fails to assess the aggregate impacts of each new rule with other rules that companies are required to comply with. So would you explain what it is the concerning that the SEC only, um, why, why it is concerning that the SEC only considers the cost of the climate rule in isolation? Yeah, I think it's, um, thank you for the question. I think it's important to realize that none of these mm -hmm. regulations or rules operate in a vacuum. Companies have to make uh, many disclosures to their stakeholders and stockholders uh, through their Form 10-Ks. And so when you analyze a rule in isolation, you might be able to assess that through a cost-benefit analysis, which I wrote at the SEC uh, mm -hmm. when I was an economist. And when you put all of those together, if you're looking at 2024, Gensler has said there's many more disclosure rules coming down the line, human capital. Uh, General Woman's time has control. expired. Yes. Thank you very much. I you back. General Woman yields back. This time we'll recognize the gentleman from Nebraska. 
Mr. Flood for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here we are yet again dealing with Chair Gensler's fountain of bad ideas. That is not my term. I've heard that from one of our most respected senior members on this committee. But let's take a look at the SEC's climate rules overall purpose. Why did it even come into being in the first place? Chair Gensler argues that the rule simply measures a risk that was already in the market. In his statement following the issuance of the final rule, the chairman said that this rule was simply an extension of the SEC's commitment to, quote, complete and truthful disclosure, end quote, regardless of the type of risk. However, when you take a step back and you look at the uh, lead up to the SEC's climate rule, it's apparent that this rule is not about accurately capturing one more material risk for public companies. Proponents of the rule express as much very openly. They say that the rule will help support, quote, the goal of net zero GHG emissions by 2050 or sooner, end quote, or to, quote, drive aggressive reductions, end quote, in greenhouse gas emissions. Can't have it both ways. You'll notice that those particular goals aren't about disclosure for investors. They're not about accurately capturing risk associated with extreme weather events or responding to investor demand. Instead, they say the quiet part out loud. This rule is about pursuing climate goals, not well-tailored disclosures, period. This makes all the sense when viewed in the larger political context. President Biden has repeatedly vowed to use any power he has to combat climate change wherever possible. And this rulemaking is yet another step in that direction. Mr. Wright. Make sure I have the right one here. There's a white and a right. This is Mr. Wright. Do you believe the SEC's climate rule is fundamentally about promising material disclosure or reducing emissions? Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe it's about either. Um, I don't think it's about material disclosure, again, because we can't count those numbers, the basic facts of our emissions there. Investors can assess that many, many other ways. But I, I think the impact of it, of course, will be increased greenhouse gas emissions by moving production from here to there. So I, I, I don't think it could be truly designed to reduce emissions either. Well, point well taken. Following up on that, uh, something in your testimony that I've already found interesting today, if you take for granted that the SEC views climate as simply a risk like any other, then why does this rule include so many detailed reporting requirements that other clearly material risks do not? I don't know. You know, it's, 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 it's hard to explain the nature of this rule. And if it was just material, you know, look, I've got to disclose anything that's a material risk to my business. Um, that's, that's what I do. Um, but it's, to mention extreme weather, that, that, that's, that's a real risk, that's been a risk forever, and it's not on an upward trend, so I, I don't know the new information there. And then the thing maybe concerns me the most is there's materiality, you know, in there, but then there's sort of a, it's sort of a fake for the oil and gas industry, because if you face transition risk, which means if the government makes it harder for our customers to produce oil and gas in the United States, that's a threat to our industry. That's not a climate risk. It's that's material, though. a policy though. risk. Yeah, yeah. It, that's material. But I don't know how to discuss or project a risk. I, I, I don't know what future rules are going to do. SEC Commissioner Peirce mentioned that no other type of risk requires, quote, prescriptive, forward-looking disclosure of the risk's impact on a company's business strategy, end quote. SEC Commissioner Uida pointed out the specific requirements related to disclosing details around severe weather losses and beyond or what a company would be required to do for any other type of risk. All that is to say that the SEC's climate rule does not merely identify an existing risk in the marketplace. It requires disclosures that elevate climate and emissions information above other requirements. If I were, uh, if I were a public company, the number one material risk, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna put everything under the sun, would be the fact that this country's $34 billion or trillion dollars in debt. That's material. Uh, that's where the SEC chair should start. So following up, Mr. Wright, what does this newfound focus on climate from the SEC mean for your company and others in the energy business? Uh, increased complexity, increased cost, and increased risk, and, and therefore less new companies, less new capital on the margin, less new activity, less new production in the country. Well said. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn, for five minutes. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us here today. Under the SEC Chairman Gensler's leadership, Iowa, my home state, small and mid-sized businesses are being crushed by both ill-thought-out rules and increased compliance costs. This pro-Green New Deal and anti-job uh, making rule for the SEC is just the latest offense in a long line of decisions by unelected DC bureaucrats forcing businesses to comply with unreasonable, unnecessary, in my opinion, bureaucratic red tape. I'd like to be able to see all the witnesses there and just remind that this 5,000 pages in front of me is just the start of what the SEC has done to hometown businesses and farmers in places like Iowa. It represents all the new financial rules forced on Iowa companies, and this is just in the last year alone. And with this new rule, we are adding 886 additional pages to the stack. This does not include the existing rules or regulations. By anyone's measure, this is unconscionable. This is far more than what anyone would expect for a small town or hometown business to do, and quite simply, it's outrageous. I'm perplexed how this administration thinks that businesses can thrive or even survive in this slosh and deluge of red tape in the environment. So with that, Professor White, I'd like to begin on the rulemaking and the ripple on effects of this for capital formation. Conservative estimates suggest that an increase in compliance costs from this rule that we're discussing today alone will result in a 21% increase in how businesses back home attempt to function. Do you think this will impact their ability to stay open? Uh, yes. At the very least, will it prevent them from going public? Uh, for sure. Could you talk to us a little bit about how you think this would impact a small or mid-sized company back in Des Moines who's going to be treated the same as a Wall Street titan? So small and mid-sized companies that are not exempt from the provisions in this rule would have an increase in compliance costs it's much more difficult for them to amortize those costs over their assets, whereas a very large company, you know, even though this is a real cost, they have more assets and more ability to pass that on to customers. Absolutely. More compliance officers, a bigger legal team, a bigger apparatus to do this. You know, I'm just from a little farm state in Iowa, but what we grow well, we grow ag, and we grow wrestlers. And I can't imagine putting a 160-pound high school wrestler in the same weight class as a 285-pound University of Iowa or Iowa State wrestler. The regulations in this environment need to follow the same aspect that we need to be able to treat different as different for a good reason and allow each to thrive in their own, in this case, weight class or own category to be successful. Mr. Wright, as we all know, the SEC's mission is to increase the ability for Main Street to have access to cash. This keeps them going. Will this rule by Chairman Ginsler help with this goal to have increased access to capital? I think no. In fact, I would suggest that this is actually going to put America's markets at a disadvantage. Would you agree? I agree. Is there a solution that you would offer that could move us in the right direction? A uh, financial risk regulator should not be getting into climate policy and the complexities of greenhouse gas emissions. You know, I, I write materials every year trying to have a more open, thoughtful dialogue about climate policy and energy policy and and maybe we should have a little more of that. I fully agree with you. And Mr. Chair, this is one of the reasons we'll be writing a letter directly to the SEC in this. We'd love your analysis in this to really shape this in the right place. Mr. Stevens, to switch gears, I'm increasingly concerned about the SEC's disregard for cost-benefit analysis and lack of flexibility in its rulemaking. This is evident in the large number of companies that are suing the SEC now just to get clarity because they can't get through this and get any consistency in what's coming out of the SEC. For example, the SEC's stock buyback rule was recently vacated because the SEC failed to complete a proper analysis or provide justification for the rules to begin. Do you see the climate rule facing a similar legal challenge? Uh, I see the climate rule being challenged on three grounds, which are the major questions doctrine, which I just discussed, uh, the APA grounds, which is the Administrative Procedures Act, whether there's what you talked about uh, in the share repurchase case in the Fifth Circuit, it was struck down under the APA by not having an adequate cost-benefit analysis and not showing that a, a real problem existed. So that will be a challenge. And the third challenge will be the First Amendment. Those will be the three challenges. Team, I think this is important today, that we should not be in a situation where only the big guys get to sue and get clarity. 
the impact is a trickle down all the way down to every farm and business in Iowa. And with that, Mr. Chair, I thank the committee. Gentle and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. I'll now recognize the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. De La Cruz, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. And thank you to the witnesses for being here to talk about um, rules that just go above and beyond uh, what not only the companies have to deal with, but what the everyday investor has to deal with. In fact, um, my colleague, Mr. Nunn, really made an impact here when he shows us the the amount of uh, paperwork that an, a company, a growing company, is going to have to deal with when they are looking at job, I mean, looking at opportunities and growth for their own companies. And let's just talk about for their own companies, but what does that mean for the everyday community member economic impact? But let's just talk about the investor. I actually have my, I had my 6 and 63 license. I deal, I dealt with investments. I understand giving the common everyday person disclosures. Already when we hand disclosures right now to investors, we hand them a packet that feels overwhelming to them. In fact, so much so that when I started in the 118, we actually passed legislation right here in this committee that would stop the paper version from coming to people's households because it was so much paperwork and we made it into an electronic format so that it would go st straight to their email. So what I'd like to hear, and my question would be to Mr. Roisman, is Mr. Roisman, are we really having a positive impact to our investors where they feel informed or will they feel overwhelmed by not only receiving the disclosures that they receive right now, but the disclosures that they will receive in addition because of this rule? So thank you for that question. I, I think there will be, there'll certainly be some investors that think this is important and there's gonna be investors that don't find this important. I, I think the concern you raise is one that, uh, frankly, I, the Commissioner Purse raised as well in her dissent, which is her dissent is titled Green Regs and Spam. And she was concerned about spamming investors with more and more information. And, and I think that's the sort of the line people always are concerned about is you wanna provide information that's decision useful for investors but you don't want to overwhelm them. And I think that's a constant balance that every company is trying to try to meet. Thank you. And I think what you said is very impactful, is overwhelming the average investor. And so what may be uh, important to, or informative to a small group, what does the average investor feel when they receive this kind? And I would say quite simply being in the business and dealing with the everyday investor, this is just simply overwhelming. But when we talk about individuals and investors' economic impact, what about jobs? How will this uh, ultimately affect job opportunities for the everyday American when it comes to companies having to deal with this climate rule? Would anybody like to take that on the? I feel like this is probably Mr. White's. Mr. Uh, White, yes. Sure, I can jump in here. So, you know, the, the rule is estimated to raise costs by 20%, and there's many companies that aren't operating at 20% margins. So some of those companies that have to, um, you know, take this cost and, and put it into their business model, they're going to be able to hire less on the margin. Um, it might benefit jobs for accountants that work in this space, uh, but as it trickles down towards smaller companies and has an impact on them going public or staying public, there's lots of academic evidence showing that IPOs create jobs. So it, to the extent that you disincentivize that, it would reduce employment. As a small business owner myself, I understand that planning for the future, we look at changes, whether it is growth or it is cost. And as a small business owner myself, I will look at the cost of doing business in increments of two to 5%, that having significant impact on the everyday small business owner or corporation. 
three to 5%. So when you tell a business owner like myself that you're estimating a public company will have a roughly 20% change, this is, this is enormous change that a company has to absorb and will not only affect their company the way they do business, but a investor and General, employees as well. Gentlewoman's time has expired. I'm Thank sure you. that you can uh, seek those answers. I'm next going to recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Ogles, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, witnesses, thank you for being here. We're, we're coming to the end. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just want to point out that Pro Professor White is from the good state or is in the good state of Tennessee at Vanderbilt University. It was actually on Vanderbilt's campus on Friday, so uh, go doors and, and thank you for being down. here. <laughs> but uh, well, welcome again. Uh, last month, the committee traveled to my great state where a state where Rep. Rose and I hosted a field hearing on this very same topic. Just as we heard then and we've heard today about how the SEC's climate-related disclosure rules play to the tune of the, administ the administration's obsession uh, with their climate change religion. And I would, I think you, you spoke to that, Mr. Wright, that you don't uh, ascribe to this religion, nor do I. The rule is illegal and unconstitutional by peppering investors with irrelevant information, as we, we see by this stack of paper behind me. It will make them less informed about what's important and will divert companies from their core purpose of maximizing shareholder wealth and creating products that increase, increases everyone's standards of le uh, living. And Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter by Advancing American Freedom and signed by more than 60 conservative groups encouraging Congress to end the SEC's carbon emission rule. The SEC's job, SEC's job is to regulate securities, stocks, and bonds not to orchestrate a destruct, destructive climate agenda behind the backs of Americans and duly elected representatives. And Without Washington. objection. And I would say, Mr. Chairman, you know, but what we've seen with many of the agencies, including uh, the SEC, is they, they are creating laws by way of rule. And enough is enough. We've got to rein this in. And before us, we have a panel of experts who have spoken to this. Professor White. Um, again, thank you for being here. Go doors. Uh, we've heard today about how the climate-related disclosure rule, rule will affect capital formation. Can you discuss specifically both the long-term impact and the short-term impact as it relates to capital? Yeah, it's in, in terms of the short-term impact in capital formation, if it makes it more expensive for companies to operate in terms of their compliance costs, then that's going to increase their cost of capital potentially. It's going to uh, rely upon the trade-off between the benefits and those costs. As you look to more of a longer-term scenario, even though the rule exempts some particular small companies, eventually those small companies grow into medium and larger size companies that have to comply. Yeah. So I would expect a negative capital formation impact both in the near and long term. Yes, sir. And I, really briefly, Mr. Chairman, you know, Mr. White, you've got a BS in finance, a PhD and MBA in finance, and you're a professor of finance, formerly a uh, financial con economist for the U.S. Securities and, and Exchange Commission. I think it's fair to say you know numbers? Yes. And you teach students? I do. Would you, do you feel that the cost-benefit analysis, if you were teaching a course and you assigned a project, would the cost-benefit analysis done by the SEC meet your standards? I think that the SEC has likely underestimated the costs. They're looking more at the direct cost of compliance, and they're also relying upon estimates of assessing some of these disclosures, some of which are uncertain inherently. Um, so, I, no, I think that it would be below the standard for accurately assessing the impact. Yes, sir. And, Mr. Chairman, rule, uh, votes have been called, so I'm about to yield back. But I just would like to say that perhaps Gary Gensler should take one of your courses before he does another cost-benefit analysis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen yields back. I'd like to thank our witnesses for testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair. The questions will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond promptly. This hearing is adjourned.